Okay, guys, so we are live. So for those listening at home, welcome to the Dungeon Musings YouTube channel. My name is Kevin Madison, and I'll be your friendly, um, what am I going to be, your friendly rogue trader, I guess? Uh, I, I still have yet to come up with a really good name for the game uh, keeper uh, in this one. But uh, uh, I will be, uh, so tonight uh, we are going to be uh, not returning to, um, at the time of recording, uh, we are just between, we've wrapped up a war story. Uh, we have in the, in the midst of doing that, we've also wrapped up a, um, yeah, I guess the, the keeper of a quarry. <laughs> um, we also uh, have wrapped up the, uh, or put, had a pause at a point in our regular campaign playing uh, Fantasy Flight Games' is very cool Rogue Trader RPG. And uh, as it typically in our all long going campaigns, uh, usually about once a year, we do a retrospective to talk about, you know, how the game's gone and, and what's happened in it and just to have a chance to uh, chat about the stuff and answer any questions that uh, folks who may be joining us in chat might have. Um, and uh, it's been 19 months now since we started this campaign. So we're a little overdue uh, for it, but I mean, in, in keeping with the theme of the ship that got lost in the warp for almost a year, I think that we're, we're doing okay on time. So um, that's what we're doing tonight. Tonight we're gonna be doing our retrospective of the first uh, 19 months of this campaign. Uh, I will go the order I've got you on the screen here first, but let me introduce you uh, for those listening at home to the stars of our campaign. I'll go the order I've got you guys on the screen here. Why don't you tell us who you are and who you play? I guess uh, I did not have your second set of tokens loaded here, but uh, uh, we'll go with the main crew for now. And if you remember who you're playing in the uh, war story, feel free to introduce that too. But first up, we have Sean. Hey, I'm playing Quinilli Aquate. He is a scion of the renowned Aquare family. Very much Road so. trader making his way, first voyage of on his own. Yeah, very nice. Uh, next up is James. Uh, so I am, and I've got to remember, it's at Regius, Regius Benetek, the ship's navigator. A man of great personal flexibility. <laughs> yes, and almost no mutations. <laughs> uh, next up is Jeffrey. Hey, everybody. I'm Jeff, and I play Alessander, the ship's void master and cactus connoisseur. <laughs> and in our other little side story, I was playing... Uh, the captain's cousin. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, uh, is our resident armor smith and uh, corporate representative from Whalen Utani, Dave. Yeah. Uh, hey. Thanks, Kev. Um, yeah. Definitely here to represent the man. Um, oh wait. Sorry. Um, I play normally play Godwin, who is the ship's seneschal. It's only slightly corrupted and no major mutations. Um, <laughs> and um, I don't even know, what was I playing in the... Uh, you were playing an Eldar um, oh, Void Reaver. Eldar. Void Reaver, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't remember what your character's name was uh, offhand. I, I should oh, have loaded it in. Those, I, I, those were in a separate game, but... Everyone is Sabak now. <laughs> nice. Uh, so yeah, so uh, what we're gonna do tonight is just, um, we're gonna bullshit a bit about uh, the way the campaign's gone. We're gonna talk a bit about what decisions characters made and uh, moments from the campaign. Uh, this one's a bit of an unusual one because um, it, often when our campaigns, uh, our ongoing campaigns uh, aren't able to play on a regular basis, often they end up kind of falling apart um, as you know happens with any um, home group as well. And uh, uh, this one, we are 19 months into the game, but we've only played 20 sessions of the main game, of the main campaign, at four, and then four sessions of the war story with a, a different one of the other 40k RPGs. And then we also have the, the one uh, care gen session as well, too. So we have had in total 25 sessions of this campaign so far. That's over 19 months. We started playing this campaign with CareGen in September of uh, 2022. So it, um, well, let me start off by, well, I guess first I'll let me finish my spiel. It's like often when, when a campaign goes that long and we start kind of, you know, um, we start having difficulty getting, uh, get, getting a table together for the game, um, 
either by conscious decision we say you know what maybe this is going to be difficult keeping this game going uh, or we start playing something else and that just kind of usurps the place that uh, that this one did but this one is carried on it, it's unusual in that sense uh, in that it has um, persisted for that long, uh, in spite of us having you know months where we're not able uh, to get the the game together for it. So, um, I guess the first thing I would ask, uh, be, what was it? Oh, I, I, now that I've I paused, I have forgotten what I was going to ask you guys before. <laughs> um, the um, you want to start with just general you. general thoughts or. Yeah, well, what I'd like to first do is let's go back to maybe the the beginning with it and talk about the characters you guys end up playing. Like I know, Dave, you ended up picking from a pair of pregens, but when we did do the character generation originally for this game, um, I guess I, yeah, I haven't mentioned, but the the reason the game came together is because we were you know Fridays are sometimes a tricky game uh, night to get uh, regular groups together, uh, and then people's schedules change on Fridays often as well, uh, so it, it's difficult to have something like that. I honestly can't remember what we were playing on Fridays before we started playing this, um, and I should have gone back to look for that. But I I know that I came back from vacation because I had taken a late vacation that year I think and had been thinking about Rogue Trader and um proposed the the game uh because i know james had been prepping some stuff for rogue trader or for dark heresy because you were going to run that in uh late 2022 and sean you had run dark heresy before right the dark heresy is the uh yeah, for a few years other yeah. fantasy flight game that has... long time ago now but yeah yep. yeah um and i can't remember if we i think we played a one shot of death watch before we did this too with Sean and I. Uh, there was yeah. like one Saturday morning or Sunday morning where we were down a bunch of players and they happened to have a game together for it. So we banged that around. So yep. I guess like, first off, what brought what attracted you guys to play in this campaign in the first place? Like Jeff, I know I that mean, was... you uh, will play. We have a standing appointment on Fridays. <laughs> so you'll be- Yeah. <laughs> My answer's pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. I but... just like to play games. It doesn't matter what we choose. Mm. I mean, I'd-, I'd um... So I'd played a ton of Dark Heresy, big fan, um, and uh, boy, I don't think I've, and and almost strangely, because I like the Warhammer 40,000 universe a lot, had a great time with Dark Heresy, I played a couple of one-shots of uh, Black Crusade, because they were at a con once, mm -hmm. but besides that, I don't think I've played, I didn't, I've never played Only War, I had never, I had never played Rogue Trader, um, so yeah, I was, and Rogue Trader was, you know, it's a, of, of all those games, I think it's, I would pro, I mean, I don't know. I think Dark, whether Dark Heresy is more, you know, in the, back in the day, at least was more popular or Rogue Trader is more popular. I think Rogue Trader more resembles, um, what people are used to, like, a, uh, an adventuring party a yeah. little bit, you know? Yeah, I agree um, with that. Yeah, and and you know you're powerful. And you got all that going. You start with the ship. I mean, you know that's pretty rare. So uh, yeah, so I was I was looking. You know, it was kind of a it was sort of a strange omission on my part to have not played that. And uh, given my uh, proclivity for Dark Heresy and the universe, so so yeah, good opportunity to uh, to give it a spin. And mm -hmm. um, and and I'm playing the Rogue Trader to boot. Mm -hmm. At James, what about you? Uh, well, I just like the well. As as everyone knows, I like the setting, so uh, I'm up for 40k, whatever. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, so uh, when this was offered, and everyone had been saying that you know this rogue trader was probably the most favoured of all the uh, FFG games. Mm -hmm. I thought absolutely, let's uh, let's get in there. Yeah, and I think that at the time we were prepping this, uh, so I'm going to come to you in a second, Dave. Don't I haven't uh, forgotten about you. Uh, but at the time we were prepping it uh, or getting making the decision to run this one, this was uh, when Owlcat had announced that Rogue Trader was going to come out, and we, we just before. So uh, at the time of recording is about uh, uh, two days after the first ep or the episodes of Fallout Prime series has come out, and we were talking about how I, I snagged a bunch of books the morning of because uh, Modifius had a discount, and then they very quickly sold out of books. 
Uh, and I was, I had a partially completed Rogue Traders uh, collection. And I was like, you know, when that game comes out, these books are all gonna get more expensive. So I'm gonna finish collecting them. And then I started reading some of the adventures and they seem pretty good. And then I fell into a, one of the last things I got to complete my collection ended up being a complete collection of it. So I actually have two sets of fucking books now. <laughs> Because it was one thing, and I was like, there's there's no way this stuff's gonna get less expensive. So if I, at worst, I could sell the stuff, or I could have a shelf copy and a, you know, playing copy or whatever. Um, so I had everything, partly because I knew I would want to fill that. I had most of the other 40K games uh, filled out. Um, and it was exactly as you guys said, that it was just, a, uh, this one seemed to be the, the commonly accepted you can run a campaign that is most like what you would do in other campaigns in this. And it's more player driven as opposed to your boss, or your commander, or your sergeant or whatever, you know, or your chaos lord um, is going to tell you what to do, which is the case with a lot of, I mean, most, if not all of the other uh, fantasy flight games. And at the time we mm -hmm. played, um, I think that the core rule book for Wrath and Glory had been published by Cubicle 7, and that was part of a republishing deal. They had, uh, Ulysses Spiele had published the first version of Wrath and Glory, something went wrong with it, and then Cubicle 7 took it in-house, reworked the whole thing, republished the whole thing with new art and whatnot, but there was not a lot of books out for it, so there was not really a second option. And since we started playing the campaign, we now have Imperium Maledictum as a game out as well. So while neither um, Wrath and Glory or Imperium Maledictum can fully replace what uh, Rogue Trader does, in particular the space, you know, spaceship combat, um, there was no other option for playing a Rogue Trader game that was an official published game at that time uh, that was fleshed out enough. Um, so Dave, what about you? Why did you, um, what attracted you to jump in on the campaign in the first place? Well, Friday nights have always been generally good nights for me for gaming. So I've, you know, sat in a lot of Fridays with Jeff and, and sometimes with other folks. And then you guys started talking about this and I didn't know anything about Rogue Trader at the time, but, uh, I really like the 40k universe and I've read a bunch of the Horus Heresy and and dabbled in a few other things but I was like wow this is kind of cool um yeah let's let's you know kind of want to see what playing a 40k um campaign would be like and see what the road trader kind of system and, and characters would be like but uh yeah it was, it was a pretty easy choice just you know jump in on Fridays and mm -hmm. play with these play with these fine fellas Nice. James is the one, yeah, who, I mean, scheduling is always an issue for every player, but James uh, gets up at an ungodly hour in order to play in these games. <laughs> yeah. It's worth Pow. noting. Yes. As well. Uh, but um, so what about the, the different roles? I know it was decided kind of the, uh, in the course of our first care gen, what uh, Sean, James, and Jeff would be playing. Uh, but, uh, and then Dave, you had uh, two decisions uh, or two choices between the pre-gens we had, but... What um, what led you guys to kind of fall into the role that you wanted to, that you ended up playing? Was there something else you thought you were gonna play coming in and then it changed or did you sort of land on what you expected? I think my first thought was a psyker and then uh, and then it came up that, uh, that, you know, we would be obviously a rogue trader doesn't make any sense, obviously, to have an NPC rogue trader. So, uh, so I'm like, oh yeah. I mean, so that became an automatic, you know, dual possibility. And then, and then we just kind of sorted it out from there. Like that was my two thoughts, and everyone else yeah. kind of, everyone. Else, we started chatting, and you know, it looks like road, you know, it looked like road trader was a was the right way to go. Mm -hmm. So that was. Oh, it's you guys, For Jeffrey, uh, James. Well, yeah, I guess I've. I didn't have any preconceptions when we came in, but uh, once it's around, I thought, yeah, Navigator was just, a f it's a fun semi-spellcaster type, as it were, that's kind of entertaining because uh, you've got a whole bunch of, and you've got a, quite a big role on the travel part, yeah. obviously, in that oh, in a yeah. ship that's worthwhile. So uh, it was just an interesting role to pick up. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jeff, is was, there any... Uh, reason you landed on the character that you landed on i mean i know the least about the world and um i just wanted to pick another 
uh, role on the ship that seemed interesting and would have some fun gameplay. And so the Void Master made a lot of sense to me as far as, you know, being involved with the captain all the time and the navigator uh, yeah. based on the other two character choices to sort of fill out the cast, so to speak. Mm hmm. And Dave, you, um, I think the choices you had for pre-drans were like the Arc Militant or the Seneschal. Yeah, so, and the Arc Militant was more martial, I thought. Yeah. Um, which aligns with some of my gaming habits, but, uh, you know, having, playing Drune and, uh, well, Alicia wasn't around yet, but like a lot of like martial characters in other games, I was thinking well, maybe I'd, try something different. And then we started talking about the Seneschal and suddenly I started thinking back, like I was getting like in the Horus heresy and there's like the, like little conspiracies and whispers behind and little cultist type meetings and things like that. I'm like, Seneschal could be fun. You'd be like rooting out all the, all the onboard ship heresy and yeah, this could be, this could be great. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was uh, kind of what I was looking at when I, or what I was thinking when I chose that role. Mm. So for the adventures we've played thus far, the only thing we've done is play the first adventure at the back of the core rulebook. Uh, <laughs> apart from the, our war story has lasted longer, but yeah, we, we've played uh, about seven pages worth of adventure over the span <laughs> of... Uh, Amazing. Uh, about 80 hours of play. That's how <laughs> so. we do it. It is how we do it, but it's also a factor of the travel rules in here for sure. You know, oh, yeah. um, like the regular viewers of the channel will know, like we don't, um, we don't really feel any need to rush through things. So we, you know, we're happy to take the time to let scenes play out and let the characters do what they want to do. And I often will add stuff into adventures because uh, I get bored <laughs> and I want to do something uh, different than what uh, is necessarily written. Um, and also, we, I mean, I think one of the things we've done in this campaign as well is there's been a gradual shifting of like, okay, well, you know, this is working this way right now, but let's try something different with it. Like we, we swapped over uh, maybe halfway through to just give you guys a basic level of training and all your skills because you were having those awful like half your stat scores in, in most of your skills. And you don't start with particularly high skills in this game. It's not like Fantasy Flight, like uh, uh, Warhammer 4th or... Um, uh, what do you have on our uh, uh, Imperium Maledictum where you kind of start with uh, on average higher stats than you did in this one. Um, okay. But we've also been slowly dabbling with some of the other uh, rules from... Um, what you call it from uh, the uh, not eye of the storm into the storm, the oh, player yeah. rule book, right? Because we we used that yeah. I think during care gen, but we didn't uh, add anything. We didn't make use of like ship rolls or anything like that. Uh, right. So let me ask you about mechanically then the advancement over the course of the twenty sessions we played with it. How are you? Uh, the the fr at first glance this appears to be one of those games that does have a long runway for for characters where you're gonna have lots of you know, I can regularly give you uh, this is the XP that the book tells you to give and you're not gonna you know level yourself out of the game. How do you guys feel about where your characters are now as opposed to where they were when they started uh, in terms of experience? No, I think it progressed well. I think uh, Regius has got fairly competent at a whole bunch of stuff. Although the knacks for me seem to be um, pump the hell out of your key stats as a, as the best way of at the beginning, because that just gives you such a boost across the board that uh, it's it's a good way of um, yeah to get going. It's kind of a, a function of um, or not a function, but similar to the issue, not issue necessarily, but like when you're making a character in um, Fantasy Fight Star Wars, um, the strategic way to build your character is just dump a shit ton of uh, points into your stats because those things are a lot harder to raise level lower on whereas skills are fast like it's an easy thing you can add on at any point when you get xp um yeah. this is similar 
in the sense of not not that it's it's harder to erase them, but that the because they benefit such a wide range of other things, then I could see why that would be an optimum way of spending your your points. Did the rest of you guys do the same thing and like focus on your key stats as opposed to flushing out your skills? Um, not I. You know I um I focus. It depends what they cost. Because some are some are cheap and some are expensive. Pretty big um, range on the uh, stats. Mm -hmm. So um, and there was you know there's some stuff that you just couldn't I couldn't pass up on the. Uh, I'm trying to I'm I'm on the verge of finding it right now. Yeah, there it is. Um, <laughs> there's just some good you know some good standard like you know you got to pop awareness, and you got to get you got to get a combat skill respectable. So you can pull your weight, you know. I mean, I'm fairly combaty, so it's important that I, you know. And I went back and forth a little bit on whether he would be at the very beginning, whether he'd be a uh, melee, more melee or ranged guy. So kind of found, you know, found my way there with some with some purchases, uh, and in, in, you know, ended up getting the ambidextrous, so I could do both. Mm -hmm. So it depends. So I mean, I'm looking at my, you know, this is a good. This particular system and character sheet does a does a good job for this because I'm looking right at it. You can see exactly what you did, and you can kind of tell what you can tell when you did it mm. because you're just stacked, right? Like you list them in in this that spot on the character sheet. So I can see where I bought quite a few characteristics. Um, I'm, I bought more of them than I'm letting on, I, I or that I remember. <laughs> uh, so I think I did do what James said, even though, I'm, <laughs> even though I'm not saying it. I'm looking at the I'm looking at the receipts. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and I bought quite a bit of those. I spent so. how much on takeaway this year? Right, right, <laughs> exactly. totally, totally, totally. Yeah, well, I mean, some stats are just it's too expensive to raise because they're not your core cool ones. So yeah. I've got only yeah. one to limp my ballistic skill up to. Mm. Not yeah. embarrassing, but the other ones. So I've got now got three characteristics over 50 and one over 60. So. Well, yeah, which, which is Which no for this game is actually quite high. Yeah. But it yeah. really helps get, uh, avoid you being completely inept. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's for the, um, well, first off, uh, Jeff and, and Dave, did you, uh, I'm going to write down so I don't forget um, what I was going to ask. But Jeff, for advancement for you guys, how did you find <laughs> Um, honestly, very, very similar to what James said there. Like, I, I basically would say I leveled my character up sort of following that exact same path. And I would, you know, mirror what Sean said. This game, this game has a really great character sheet for like seeing what you are getting your points, seeing where they go. Um, the one thing I would add is this, this system has something I really have come to enjoy in a game where it's like, here's your... F 500 xp or whatever every session and like i like that where you're constantly getting a little bit better yeah, yeah. i've come to yeah. like that version of uh level and experience much more than like nothing's happening nothing's happening nothing's happening oh go up a level all these things change it's way harder to uh, manage your new abilities sometimes depending on how complicated they can be or how many things change whereas here it's like one little bump each time or if you save up for something big you sort of you learn it one thing at a time i don't know i, I really like it i think there's also it. um Good point. The, i think there is a um there's an added incentive to actually engage with the care gen part of the game when you're doing it that way you know, where it's not, because uh, like every player has a different level of interest or whatever else in engaging in kind of theory crafting their character or building their character. But mm -hmm. if you have that regular drip, not only does it give you an, a, a regular way of just making small incremental improvements, it also conditions you to, to start thinking about your character in that broader kind of design context. Where am I gonna put these skills? Even uh, one of the things, we, we have a player we used to play with, um, uh, Dave, Dave O. Uh, Jeff and Dave is not really a very um, he is not a very <laughs> he like system heavy guy he's very happy no. to be like I want to play a guy who does X just build me X that's fine and Shadow of the Demon Lord was the first game I saw where he was full fucking on doing care gen because that one gives uh -huh. you regular advancements in the oh, form of getting new levels yeah. each time and you get to pick a new class or whatnot 
yeah. and that so it, it echoes the thing that i think that that's a way of getting the people who might not be as inclined to learn the character or engage with the, those little the nitty-gritty bits of character generation it gives you that regular incentive to do so yeah yep. fair enough yep. Yep. yeah yep. what about you dave what's how about how did you find advancement for godwin um well first off i missed a lot of sessions so my character is definitely back <laughs> behind <laughs> in experience he probably doesn't have as many topped up skills and stuff but that's that's fine and, and that's just a the way things worked out but um i also did things differently so i wasn't strategically thinking like james is hey i'm gonna max out these um attributes um for me i i often in games and in, in particular in this one i tried to pick things in my advancements that had to do with that session's role playing mm. or adventure mm. so um i'm looking at some of the stuff and it's like oh i after we played for a bit i took some increase in fellowship because i was trying to improve my you know ability with the uh the other characters and the crew but then i took a ballistic skill and then it took toughness and i'm like hmm, ballistic skill because i was shooting at somebody and i was terrible <laughs> toughness because i probably got my ass handed to me <laughs> like it's just, i'm wounded i'm dying okay i need some, i need to be tougher so it's like i chose things that I'm like hey my character needs this to be better and it, that ties in with what jeff says so when you're playing those games and nothing against D D 5e or, or anything like that but mm. you hit a level and you get this skill you get you know these attribute points or you get a bunch of a feed or a bunch of stuff you have like a lot of things that happen all at once and this has you th this works better this system works better for somebody who's like i want to grow organically from the things that have happened because you they're right there in your head like we just finished this session and I, and I was laying there bleeding i need to be tougher i picked mm -hmm. toughness then if i'm playing a a six level character in D D 5e that could be like 10 sessions i'm not gonna remember all the things that happened over those 10 sessions and like how do i organically grow it's like oh i don't really have much of a choice except if i'm choosing a feat or, mm -hmm. or something like that so this allows you to have that organic growth in the character development mm -hmm. a lot easier than the other systems yeah yeah I, I do completely agree with that i think that that's um that's the other thing i think that's that's interesting is you can have more immediate um attention to things that matter you know uh where some games uh, we, we all have a friend at the table not at this table necessarily but like we all have a friend we play with who theory crafts like fucking crazy right like whatever the mm -hmm. game is they've got their character up to whether it's 20th level or whether it's you know a thousand xp or whatever the fuck it is they've got their budget done and they've got their character you know kind of pre-designed um there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever like everyone plays and enjoys games a different way but um if you do play in that like setting aside the role playing part of it i think it's also just that is a smart way of building as well because there are things that become apparent and valuable in the game that may have you know a value attached to them that is disconnected from the design documents or the design stuff right like i i've noticed that some games now in particular i uh, uh, it's going to shock you guys to hear me speak positively about uh, the Elder Scrolls uh, unofficial role-playing <laughs> game here. But one thing they do really smart is they tell you things. You should have high levels of X, Y, Z because that's shit that's going to be important, you know? And oh. this game would be beneficial to say, take points in dodge, you know? Take points in whatever, like the things that will be important in the kind of game you're playing. Um, yeah. Traveler does this uh, in, and I can't remember if pre-Mongoose it did, but I know the Mongoose versions of, of uh, Traveler has like a set of um, uh, skills that you basically, after everyone does care gen, you figure out what kind of campaign you're playing and then everyone takes turns picking skills from this list. Because if you're playing that kind of game, you need to have that skill set at least somebody doing this shit. So you're able to sort of like do that and then build up redundancies. And the don't do the exact same thing in, in um uh it's not the same thing as what elder scrolls does where it's, it's telling you pick you know these things will be important in your campaign but it would be probably good to have uh something similar to that as an overlay to be like look this is shit that's going to be important if you're playing a, um a yeah having healing in pf2 exactly 
th those kind of <laughs> uh, like um, meta level analyses of how the game is intended to play it would be good to include that in here too and say like, mm -hmm. oh, although I, I don't feel that you guys hit the hole that we found with uh, in our, our Traveler game. It is always uh, enjoyable when I ask for a recon check in our first couple of sessions and the entire fucking crew is like, oh, because <laughs> nobody had it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but that's the thing that's, that's cool about this kind of game is that you can make those things like, oh, fuck, this game is, this is actually pretty valuable. I should have training in this or this thing is um, in the way that we're playing this campaign or the way that our characters sync together, you can adapt that, um, you know, and and uh, kind of refocus how, where you're developing your characters. So I, that is... And I think, uh, because, uh, you know, apart from that, I did put in the characters, but otherwise you do things that you want for your character. But I think this one's got a ton of choices in it of your talents and skills and all the rest of it that you can... I mean, you're steered a bit by your character class because you can pick from that list, but still you've got a pretty wide choice. And unlike some games, they're not... They're all pretty decent, so they're worth taking. So you can go the way you want to go. Whereas I found back in the day with something like... Um, uh, Slyhander, there was a million choices and 80% of them were trash. So you were down to the 20% and then suddenly that big huge list became actually remarkably narrow. Yeah. Um, and therefore you went, you got funneled that way. Whereas in fact, surprisingly, you do have quite a lot of choice in mm -hmm. this because you can think I could go this way, I could go that way. Well, you know, what feels right? And they're all viable. And that's a bit like PF2, which you felt that you've got a lot of choices, but there's, you know, they're all decent. Yeah. You don't feel if I role play, I get, I mess myself up. Do you think that speaks to just the like the strength of the underlying game design? That yeah. it's you know like because the PF2 is a similar way like the because of the way the math works in PF2, it's it's hard, it's not impossible, but it's hard to build a you know a suboptimal character in that. Like it's pretty easy to be a you're, you're picking. Um, variations of expression there isn't a clear optimized choice the way there was in like pf1 or in you know 3.5 and i don't fault those games uh, for that just that, that that's what they did there were things that were no-brainers fourth edition D, &D if I, I know uh, a universally acclaimed system um i love fourth edition D, &D but uh, one of the things they did is that they introduced um, a set of uh feats in the third player's handbook that became like you'd be stupid not to take it as one of your first skills so it became this like well if everyone's taking this thing like why bother having it as a feat then because it's not a real choice you're making it's a thing you have to take because mm -hmm. you need that to be optimal and i think there's some mm -hmm. um yeah there's some things like maybe like that uh in other games as well no, I aren't. think it really helps for, as you say, not dissing on games that don't, but for me, I like the fact that it gives me that choice to build the character mm. as I like it because I'm not nerfing myself by doing it mm -hmm. as you, well. You also each have pretty clear thematic spotlights uh, for the areas where you excel, I think, as well. Is that fair to say, guys? Yeah. Like, James yeah. drives the ship. Uh, Godwin listens to the shadows. Uh uh, Captain Aquare runs the, you know, runs everything, and Alessandra has the worst gun on the entire crew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey. that's always true, right? That's yeah. Right. <laughs> tradition, tradition at this point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it has yeah. improved. Is it? I what are you I using did. now? What I are you think... using these days? Uh, no, I, oh, never mind. Yeah, I saw the best hand cannon. <laughs> it's it's our other game. Yeah. I, 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 uh, in Traveler, nope. you actually upgraded to a ghost pistol. <laughs> yeah. In this game, it's still... The hand you know, cannon. I mean, the, the three of us, I may have to get Regius and uh, Godwin, we have to pitch in for his Christmas gift or something, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whatever hol or the Emperor's Day, whatever whatever passes for uh, the holiday. And, uh, Every day is Emperor's Day, heretic. Well, that's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, okay, I think we can get the crew to chip in and... Chip in, yeah. Get Alessandra an Emperor's Day pistol. Yeah. Mm. Oh my goodness. Maybe we can get <laughs> Poor Alessandra. 
So if you were uh, in a position to, well, not in a position to change, uh, first off, do you have any regrets about the role that you're playing? Or would you, if you had to pick a single role to play in the crew, would you pick something different? Setting aside the other players already occupying the role. So is there someone who is thinking like, boy, that would be cool to be the rogue trader or does anyone think that the navigator would be a pretty badass thing to play or the Seneschal or the pot, the uh, void, uh, what is it just called? Not void reaver, void. Um... Master? Void master, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who wishes they were management? <laughs> <laughs> no way. No way. <laughs> They're all assholes. I think that Godwin is, uh... Definitely would make a great rogue trader. Mm. Uh, yeah. uh, uh. Gotta keep like my eye on Godwin. And do it. <laughs> yeah. Stab at the back. Not that Cornelia does a bad job, but you know. Of course. Oh, of course. Present company happened, accepted. I mean, obviously. Something happened to him. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, that was fun. One of the fun things with our um, our war story was uh, shaking up the roles that you guys were actually playing uh, too. Uh, James was still playing a psychic mutant, you know, character, but a psyker is a very different skill set than from what the navigator has. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I like the medic. I mean, yeah, obviously, completely different. And yeah, uh, yeah it was fun. Yeah, good. Uh, it's good to mix it up. I mean, I, and I, I mean, I, I almost like. Um, I sometimes like the uh, when I'm going to play in a game, and so you know, and it turns out okay, you know, you're this guy, and I'm like, all right, let's go. Like you know, you get it almost a sign because it's just something you might not normally play, you know. So it's it's kind of fun sometimes to just kind of get something out of the hopper and and mm -hmm. go with it. Well, and that can, like normally I, when there's pregens going into something, um, I prefer to give you guys a couple of choices for things. But yeah, in that yeah. one, the overwhelming consensus from the players of the first session, like we need a fucking medic in this. Right. And then once we had the <laughs> medic, where they were like, we need a fucking Eldar, and that's how Dave ended up with an Eldar. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was fun, actually. Um, I th I don't know if the, uh, having an Eldar on our ship would be in the cards or if these secondary characters are going to somehow fold into our mm -hmm. main adventure. But, uh, that's a fun character to take out for a spin. I know we've talked about that in other campaigns where if you've got more than one character, you, you know, you play one for a session, like the old dark sun method. Yep. Um, and, um, uh, but yeah, I think I, I really like that character just the way it played out partly because it was a duelist shoot it like it was kind of like playing share on a off friday but. yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> but yeah yeah the that's, Elder... the, that's the advantage of rogue trader right because you really do have a lot more flexibility than all the other games absolutely Road Trader is one of the ones where you can, uh, in theory, there are, it's a fan-made product, but there's a fan-made product of playing regular Eldar, and the official rules have Dark Eldar as player characters. They have hmm. Orcs as player characters, Crute, um, like there's a wide variety of things. There's Tau, there's rules for playing Tau in it, which is also awesome. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, this this is definitely the, the campaign that you can have as much flexibility you can have that kind of mishmashed, you know, character group that would require uh, campaign or like in fiction explanations for why they're getting along. There's some great, um, you know, uh, Inquisition books where you see characters like apart from fucking chaos characters coming in to work with them. You do see folks of a variety of different factions working together. Orcs less so. I'm and I'm not familiar enough with the Black mm -hmm. Library of books, but. Dave and James, are you guys familiar with any things where the orcs team up with any members of the Imperium against a third threat, or are the orcs always yeah. like, yeah, like the orcs? I don't it's think like so. there are certain things I feel like there's never going to be a team up where it's like the Necrons, the orcs, and the Tyranids. There's absolutely no talking to any of those, and there's a right. permanent threat to your planet if they get infested on there. Right. The Tau, the Eldar. Um, what are the other factions? Less so the Dark Eldar, but like the Craftworld Eldar or the Freebooters and the Tau. I feel like those, you could see where there would be cooperation against a third threat. Yeah. You know? Strukari, though, I, that, that one does make me scratch my head. <laughs> How anybody would want to mix with them because they're bonkers. Oh, yeah. And I don't... Um... 
yeah, I don't know. I, like, it's they, there are rules for it, but I can tell you that I have not read them because it doesn't. Um, the Drakari do have a, like an interesting backstory to them, and and I, I kind of dig that. But I view them as adversaries more so than I do as player characters, partly because they seem so fucking nineties. Like they feel like <laughs> the most nineties thing that has remained in Warhammer Forty K of just like I'm gonna have a helmet, okay, and it's got spikes. All right, <laughs> cool. And right. I'm gonna have armor, uh huh. And it's got blades. Sure, yeah, of course it does. <laughs> uh huh. And my gun. Right. What does it shoot? Does it shoot blades? No. <laughs> it shoots shurikens. It's <laughs> fuck. Yeah, of course it does. Fuck. Uh, I say that as someone who loves Crafter. I fucking love the Eldar. It was so cool seeing you playing an Eldar in the game, Dave. Just because it's a. Uh, um, it's been something I would have been wanting to see in a 40k RPG for like since the original Rogue Trader came out. And who doesn't want to shoot shurikens out of a gun? Honestly, right? like, God, this is a, <laughs> I say this stuff, but it's a, it's a textbook self loathing. <laughs> I want my fucking shuriken gun, damn it. <laughs> I was gonna say the the sloth too. They're they're more minor. Um, they're in dark heresy. Mm. But they're a uh, they're an intrinsically evil bunch that I don't think you could ever. Uh, they were uh, kind of PC killers. You throw them in there, and they're going to be tough. Yeah, too tough. Yeah, mm. and I, I just don't know. Like I, I don't know because of the or way orc biology works with the spores infesting a planet. Oh, like yeah. I just don't. I'm sure there's a reason for why they uh, are like allowed to be part of a crew with the rogue trader, but it boggles my mind that you would you know. Uh, that you would have that setting aside the like you know the concern over xenos scum and whatnot rogue traders is you know but is it profitable yeah. um, <laughs> right and, and sometimes inquisitors the inquisitors will throw something like oh, you'll fair see enough. Um, yeah 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 eldar in there once in a while it's unusual but possible yeah. well that's the thing like, it's funny because when we were making you the characters for the because i wanted to use the wrath and glory one to stretch the the party a little bit um yeah. and that's what i was thinking like well the like the, the Krieg uh, Death Corps, um, Krieger, Krieg Death Corps, yeah, Krieger, yeah, Death Corps, Krieg, Krieg, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they are such an iconic looking thing, and I was like, boy, it'd be really badass if we could have it be one of them. And I'm like, wait, what? What? The fuck not. Yeah, you know these dynasties go back. We don't even need to have it. Re it's not like oh, this person owes you your life. It's just that the, they owed you did something to assist them at some point, and now they constantly send your family a you know a small you know company sized thing that you can distribute amongst your your crew. Yeah, badass. Yeah, yeah. You know you get to have your space marine and or not necessarily space marine, but you get to have your other cake and eat it. Um, all in the context of the same campaign. Um. What are the rest of you guys? Uh, Godwin is, uh, could see himself wearing the uh, the big uh, hat at some point. James, Jeff, Sean, could you guys see yourself playing another role? I mean, probably the one I was originally thinking of is probably a psyker. Yeah. If I was going to like some kind of either uh, some either a sneaky psyker or a combat sniker, uh, psyker, one of those. Mm -hmm. Psyker is good, but I like navigator. Navigator is nice. Mm. But I think we were talking about how maybe. Um, a wrath and glory make psychers a bit easier to play. Yeah, yeah, and they, and that's from both sides too. Because like I've used uh, an Lady Astra. Was that her name? Um, Lady Ash. Lady Ash. She was your uh, adversary, and like the psychic powers are, they're cool. Um, I felt that they were easier to implement and. The Psyker felt more like it does in fiction, where it's like you bring us in. in, in I, I've used the Shadowrun uh, parallel to mages when I was when we were playing last time, but like mages are very much the counter to mages in Shadowrun. If you don't get to shoot them beforehand, then what you need to do is get a bring a mage with you because the mage will counter spell, will dispel elementals, and will cast magic that can affect other people. Um, that gets around some of their more technological advantages that they might have. You know, uh, Zorchin, your crazy cybered up, you know, street samurai with a fucking willpower or a mana blast. Pretty good way to hurt him because he's using his willpower to resist that instead of using his body. Um, mm. Similarly, you felt like a really potent tool and also potent counter tool in that, James. And like that, especially like when you clinched that uh, um, deny the witch right near the end where everyone suddenly was able to move and act freely. 
That was pretty yeah. fucking clutch, and I think that really that felt pretty cool. And I don't think that Rogue Trader uh, or Imperium Maledictum, for that matter, would offer the same kind of uh, experience. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, because it, it it does work better than the fiction. Because in the in the fiction, psychers are scary. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I like it, it's fun the um, the uh, magic user if they have if there's some good magic user dual dual uh, rules like that of deny the witch is uh, is a fun um, spell counter spell kind of it's a good it's fun yeah and like I didn't well, find um, in Rogue Trader at least the, we're going to talk about uh, in uh, uh, Wrath and Glory um, we'll I, I didn't find that the psyker was over like it wasn't a matter of like okay you got a psyker so the other side's fucked it's like okay there's a psyker so we have a challenge that we're dealing with and because you were having to blow your one of your resources and like not use your actions to try and maintain that that felt you were contributing in a meaningful way but not in a way that was just like well because the other side doesn't have a counter you are screwed which unfortunately can be the case in in general in certain editions of it right because you guys didn't feel like you were affected by that guy's uh uh counter or like his his version of the um befuddle or whatever ability he was using but it didn't take you out of the combat right yeah right yeah it's a good way to go right mm. you know that that discussion of you don't want to um i mean removing all agency is a big deal obviously um mm -hmm. and um and there's different ways to handle it but uh yeah it's nice the, the um the nerf is a good that's a good uh compromise where everyone mm -hmm. just gets nerfed you know it's it's a bummer but you're still in there you know you're still swinging away yeah and there's also it, uh narrative meta currency ways that refresh fairly relatively speaking fairly often that give you ways to mitigate against that too yeah, yeah. right let and the gm soak up that realized, meta currency. yeah if your psyker had realized he could deny the witch earlier in the combat that would have been even easier <laughs> Next time, next time. <laughs> it's that tricky last sentence in the paragraph that uh, C7 does, so... <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about you, Jeff? Is there another uh, character type that you, you know... Uh... Um, yeah, the... I, I don't know the names of them. There's the 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 combat master or the... Oh. The, I, I'm not uh, sure the title of it. Uh, Arc Militant. Arc Militant. Um, it would be fun to try out. Uh, not that I don't like my role, but just, you know, me, I like to try other things out. And it, it seems like it fills an interesting role uh, in the game and something that we maybe as a group were a little slow with, which was sort of our combat skills. The captain kind of held his own, but the rest of us struggled at times, I think. Well, part of that was also us all getting a feel for the system, right? Because uh, getting... Uh, on a on an appear like on a glance, um, the game seemed to be uh, it read a lot more deadly than what it actually is in play. Like I was expecting like one shot and you guys are down kind of situations, right. and that's really not the case in the game because of the yeah. way toughness works and armor works and whatnot. Meta currency, yeah, meta yeah. currency's in it too. Like it's just not as deadly as what uh, it appears to be. It's a lot more cinematic um, than what I thought. Right, yeah. Oh, for sure. I, I don't mean that it was deadly, just that, like, we didn't feel like combatants. So at least Alessandra mm. doesn't. He feels like he's, uh, I don't know. Like, I guess it's also some of the enemies we've come across were, like, on a, not necessarily a tier above us, but kind of a tier above us in combat. And so it would just be interesting to see what the combat more combat focused character yeah. would play like in the in the game setting well i don't, I don't have it as part of the playlist for this because it's not really part of the campaign but we did play uh one session of a couple of us playing uh death watch the space marine version of it and that was you guys were pretty <laughs> badass in that combat for oh, them yeah. was yeah. Can I mention how much I like Death Watch? Can <laughs> I, I point you? Can I point you at my bookshelf? <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. Because I think it was everyone other than Sean, right? I think who was able to make that session. I think you might have been gone. That and with the captain gone, we and there was a captain focused session, and so we played a a pickup session of Death Watch. I think with the other three, right? Because I think Dave uh, played. Yeah, I think so. You played a um, Black Templar, I think. Weren't you yeah. playing the sword and board guy? Yeah, and then 
Uh, I'm not going to guess. I'm fairly certain I'll give my left leg that James played the Ultramarine. Yeah, I was a Smurf. Yeah. <laughs> and then, Jeff, I'm trying to... I actually don't remember what you played. Were you the heavy weapons guy? Or were you oh, the... Oh, gosh. Kev, this is a very, very difficult question. question. What was that, By the way, I'd like to say I could have been a Salamander as well. I'm not purely Smurf. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember all the options looked awesome in that game. That's all I remember about looking through those characters. I don't remember which one I chose because they all looked uh, very interesting to play. So, and you... you really would feel, because right, oh, the stuff that we faced, some of it was quite scary with like the uh, battle servitors and all the rest of it. But if you were the space marines, you'd just go in and... Just... Oh yeah, Put a smack on those things. I think you guys took down a uh, one of the like mid-sized bosses uh, in the. I can't remember what they're called, but uh, it was one of the like really scary tyrannids, and you guys took on three of them and took them down. Yeah, Dave. Sorry, we were talking over you. What were you going to say? No, I just I'm trying to remember what Jeff was playing. I thought he was playing like a blood angel or something like that. Oh, that could uh, be. I don't remember. I had. The ones I had, there was five pregens I had. Uh, there was the um, uh, Psyker that Sean played in that pickup that he and I played. Uh, James was the Tac Marine uh, Ultramarine. You were the Black uh, Templar. And the other two ones were an Iron Hands Tech Marine and a... You know what? It might have been Blood Angels. The Apothecary was something, but I can't remember what what uh, chapter it was from. It might have been Blood uh, Blood Angels because I think the Blood Angels Apothecaries are white armored, and I remember the the I know the Apothecary has white armor in it. Maybe it was a Space Wolf actually. Hold on. Oh, these all sound familiar, but probably because I'm just remembering reading through them all. Oh yeah. yeah. I actually don't remember <laughs> offhand. One of them is a space wolf who was a tech... Mer I could open up the game during our, our mid-session break and I'll figure it out. But in any event, that was a much more combat-focused thing, definitely, where you guys were really... And I think the game holds uh, together well at that um, at that tier of play as well, uh, you know, with... Yeah. And, you know, Death Watch for me is literally... A writer's dream come true so when i was reading a bunch of the horse heresy books i was actually looking for black library open submissions and i wanted to write a space marine story that included a bunch of different chapters like remnants of chapters and guys that got stranded together or something like that and have them fight together and then never ended up doing it because they rarely have open submissions <laughs> they're mm. very closed but um at least that, that I was aware of it at the time. And then years later, we're playing this game and it's a bunch of Space Marines from different chapters all mashed together. And I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so something with the with Death Watch that's um, interesting in comparison to here. So that we've been using, uh, they don't call them skill challenges, but they, they're they skill challenges, right? Like they're a part of the rules as written. They're introduced in the core rule book. They're expanded in the, I think they're, what are they called? Is it challenges? Endeavor? No, endeavors is the other sort of underlying mechanic. Um, you know what I mean? Where you're rolling and you're adding your degrees of success to, and trying to reach a, a certain total uh, with them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, exploration challenges. Here we go. Yeah, that's what it's called. So um, those, I think, offered, because we've used those in a couple of different... Uh, ways and i think that they find it there's an interesting way of adding more skill structure to the um or more game structure to the to the non-combat part of the of the game which in this camp type of campaign is probably going to be a lot of it hmm. um but the one thing we haven't really been playing with all that much has been the profit factor and the endeavors uh, section of the rules. Have any of you guys actually read those? I did when we first started, but I gave up on it because we really haven't spent a lot of time in civilization where profit factor, because my character has that built into some of his like main, his core stats and stuff. Yeah. 
The reason oh, I right. just, yeah. How about uh, the rest of you guys? Anyone? I'm similar. I, at the beginning, I remember, you know, looking at it, and um, but I couldn't tell you what it said now. I'd have to, you know, reread it. I'd have yeah. To. So the thing I find, um, the Endeavor system or the mechanic, it seems to require a great deal of um, force structure on a campaign uh, that everybody has to be involved with that to me feels... Uh, forced um you can use it to try and offer a a way of like rewards and like kind of retroactively adding rewards in but the profit factor thing is a, a strange mechanic that i still don't i've read it over three or four times i still don't quite understand what the point mm. of it is um mm -hmm. you know like i just don't find it a particularly interesting part of the of the game um and uh, in particular because of like the pace we play it doesn't feel like it transfers it, it, while every other part of the game you guys are getting regular feedback you're able to, to build up your characters and whatnot that's a part of the game that's just it takes so long for us to get to the point where you're seeing that profit factor be changed one way or the other that it just doesn't and it's not it doesn't feel like there's an awful lot you can do with it apart from like sort of the downtime uh, period it's not a particularly interesting mechanic for me and I mentioned that in contrast to the really clever and dynamic, you know, sort of uh, metagame mechanic that's in Death Watch, where you've got like, these are your objectives. And obviously it's a different structure and that one has a much more rigid, like this is your mission and here are the different things you can do that will give you certain benefits over the course of this. Go fucking do what you want to do, you know? Um, but that structure feels uh, a lot more connected to the kind of stories you're telling than what this other one does you know um there's clear objective benefits for getting those things in death watch and they're achievable over the course of a single adventure rogue trader feels like it's built to be played over a longer period but there's less tangible connection to what you're choosing to pursue and your slow build up of resources it's just a weird i'm sure people like they wouldn't have kept adding on to it um but uh, if you know if, if it didn't uh, function, and I've heard people talk about it in favorable ways, or seen people talk about it in favorable ways online, I just can't figure out wh like why it justifies itself. Um, mm -hmm. It's also know. we can get get Alessander a new gun. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Higher our profit factor, the more money we have for Alessander's gun, and maybe. True. Yeah, I mean, clearly we do need a new gun. Yes. <laughs> hint hint season two kevin <laughs> alessandra gets a gun <laughs> yeah um we'll see at your review alessandra we'll see yeah it. we'll see if he's earned it yeah. <laughs> like i don't know it, it's weird because like i have weeks where i'm thinking like i'm just ignoring it altogether which we have been doing a lot of the time just because it isn't changing it isn't coming up in every session and there's times where i'm like no no we should really be like fucking drill down and figure out what these rewards are and make it clear for you guys but I don't know, like, do you guys feel that is the, the third thought I have also had, having heard what you guys have enjoyed about your, your playing your characters and, and advancing your characters, none of it involves the, the broader context of the endeavors or developing the ship or any of their stuff. But that might be because we haven't done a lot of that stuff yet either. Prop factor is how you upgrade your ship, but it doesn't seem to go down though. Like that's just a, a purchase, so. I don't know. Like it's, I get it's a challenge to abstract out the incalculable wealth that a rogue trader would have access to. But like, if you're gonna have a mechanic that is gonna impose an element of scarcity into the game, I feel like it should be easier to understand and implement because they they do something like that in Wrath and Glory that seems to work pretty fucking well and sh mm. shows how the rogue trader excels at that specific area. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean we have yeah we haven't interacted with it too much. Um, I mean maybe once, right? Is it, have we interacted with it more than once? Uh, we've used the. I've made reference to what you guys got out of certain achievements, but it's tough when it's just like if it's if you if we're not involving it from the player's side, then there's not agency in deciding what you're doing. It's just you know like 
surprise rewards that are unconnected with anything you've specifically elected to work towards, right? Like the way that it's structured in uh, Death Watch, it's clear, here's my objectives. And then as certain objectives come up, you can also transparently feel like, okay, now you've learned about that there's X, you know, squad that is uh, survived whatever thing that you were going into. If you extract them, that is also an objective, a secondary objective that can give you rewards. It's harder to, or at least I don't think that there is the clear tangible reward in the Endeavor mechanic the way it is. It's a really clever, like I, I love the idea of structuring uh, adventures and incentivizing players doing things uh to get tangible rewards from before we went live we were talking about uh seventh c second edition and by talking about it, i mean i was slandering it uh, horrifically but one thing that i really love about that one is that you actually set uh, a, like for each individual character you set um goals you kind of have like uh oh this is the thing i want to play like i want to confront my evil cousin and do whatever and here are the five steps i need to take between that stuff here you go, DM, incorporate the stuff where you feel fit. And there are tangible rewards you get as you hit each of those things. So it gives you an, I mean, that fits the sensibilities of that kind of swashbuckling adventure, but that might be, it's, I feel like that's kind of similar to what you could be doing with this game mechanic. Cause the structure is there of saying like, I want to set up a colony and start having, you know, money come in from that. Or I want to set up a trade route, or I want to, try and you know uh make peace with a, a rival you know dynasty all of these things are things that add structure to the adventures and then broadly the campaign for your different things but the endeavor mechanic i just don't find it's giving it doesn't really give a, a clear enough and meaningful enough reward from it and maybe i'm gonna have some angry comments from people who are like dummy this is the way it works and as long as it's politely <laughs> phrased I, I i welcome that insight as to how it's worked so if there is anyone else who, at home who has uh, run this and seen it like a way of that playing out more effectively in your games i'd be eager to hear it i just after running this for almost two years now i still just don't see it i don't see why that's a the, using that actual mechanic I mean, I, are, are we, um, were we a little bit in the midst of using it since we're kind of in between We're we're going to land on footfall, right? So we yep. have, we're about to do a little bit of it now going forward. Maybe there was a, cause I, 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 and I may be misremembering this, but we were chattering a little bit about who needed what, you know, Ali Sonder always comes up because of his, you know, dog ass, you know, hands. Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the captain had his eye on a couple of, you know, little this and that little, a few uh a few rogue trader trinkets that um looked attractive so those are more um things for like specific acquisitions as opposed to actually endeavors so like endeavors oh, are gotcha. things like establish an imperial colony exploit gotcha, a gotcha. world resource establish a cold uh, trade from a dead xenos planet establish a trade yeah. route um, and gotcha, then that's gotcha. broken down into different smaller tasks that you do and then you build up different points from each thing you have, uh, you achieve maybe spitballing maybe what i'll do and i guess let me before i, I lose this thought though the other problem is though is that we're going to make use of um the of any pre-made adventures uh which i've got a, quite a few of them and they're actually pretty fucking interesting and good yeah they do have those endeavors in there but like the players aren't necessarily if you're sitting down to play the uh, a pre-written adventure like it's written like any other kind of adventure where there's reasons for why your characters get involved there's you know rewards and the people that you gain over the course but they also provide the endeavors in there and i just don't understand why they have the endeavor mechanic in there if, if all they want to do is have a reward for you know like and now your profit factor is going to go up in a different way well why not just have that f a fucking separate thing you know if there's going to be because what what it feels like to me is by putting that shit in there, you're almost setting it up like a, an old tournament league module where like there is a clear right way to go your way through this because you'll score better by going through this endeavor in a specific way. That's being a little uh, uncharitable to it because there's it's not quite the same that way, but a lot of it is, you know, there's certain goal posts you got to meet. There's certain achievements that get more benefit than, than the other ones do. Um, what I was intending on doing with our next leg of the campaign is to go into one of these adventures. Um, what I might 
take a pass they look at. pretty good you told us a little bit about them they look they sound oh, pretty good so many there's at least yeah there, there's a couple ones i've got on deck that are all really good and really interesting like they're great nice. they're really well written things it's just the endeavor system yeah. i just but we can yeah i'm thinking of jettisoning it jettisoning it all together and just figuring a different mm. way of handling the thing you guys haven't been interacting with the system in a meaningful way in 19 months now so i i don't know that you're you know losing out dave which ways did your character specifically interact with profit factor you said that there were ways that uh, your character interacted with that is there something that your character does that specifically feeds back into them well my character is designed uh he came with uh trained in commerce yep uh that was his like initial character build he was two check boxes already in commerce as an advanced skill. Yeah. Um, and then I thought there was a so talent of some kind. Yeah, maybe take a look at your talent. Or, uh, I can open up your character sheet as well. Oh, it was just the plus 10 bonus to interaction skills when dealing with high authority and form So that's, again, that's different from, because like, you know, um, yeah, like an endeavor can be just conquer a world and turn it to profit, right? Like that's... Yeah. The, the commerce part of it is definitely part of the uh, the gameplay, but it doesn't directly relate to the endeavors unless you've structured the endeavor that way. And even then, like the endeavors aren't, let me give you an example of what the uh, system is. So like a simple one, like establishing an uh, imperial colony. First thing you need to do is confirm uh, a planet as a suitable colony world. So you got to find a place and, and do that. Next thing is establish dominance over one of the guilds on that planet. And then the third objective is clear the uh, near voids of pirate scum. So clear the area so it's safe. Mm. That is the first colony. That's You would complete those objectives, then you would have it set up. The second, and then you would get at the end of that plus four to your profit factor. And the way yeah, you would so, measure success in that is by counting how many points you got towards the different endeavors, <laughs> the achievement points. And like, so all my commerce skill is used specifically when I'm negotiating with somebody else on an acquisition test. And if my commerce skill versus their commerce skill or scrutiny skill, um, if I, for each degree the explorer beats his opponent he may increase profit factor by two points for each degree the opponent beats him however he must decrease profit factor by two points so i think it's me negotiating on behalf of the ship that's increasing potential wealth but yeah, that's the weird thing with profit factor two is that there's so few you don't spend it like a currency it's just one of these things that goes yeah. down by misfortune it doesn't seem like there's a way of spending it down. So like the whole endeavor system is to, in one part, it, like lend structure to a campaign. And the other thing is, is to provide a, a framework by which to judge how many profit points, how profit factor points you get. But profit factor seems to only ever go up by action. Uh, and then it only goes down by misfortune. And misfortune yeah. that doesn't seem to be connected to things you guys are choosing to do. There are like Other minor way. roles to avoid misfortune, but it feels like, I don't know, like, um, yeah, I'm happy to do the, the the expedition type thing that you're talking about. Sounds pretty cool. And well, it sounds and cool, but like, like I don't know if we need to have points scored in it. Is what I'm getting at. Is that like the way that those are normally structured? Is like you'll get like t in establishing the world. I might say there's like um, I don't know. You need a total of 1,600 achievement points in order to succeed in this endeavor, and I'll score out what different things are you know, over the course of that. And then as you complete them, you gain achievement points. We compare that to the total. Then we see whether you get, uh, your profit factor goes up. Um, you could also, um, if you thought there was a way to, uh, I, I, if, there, if you thought it would be helpful to take a firmer hand and apply an endeavor on our behalf, you know, that'd be fine too, that if it- Yeah, and that's sort of what we've been doing is, like the the idea the broad idea of like oh you're going to um 
you know, uh, there, we're going to think through the steps you need to make in a, in a, in achieving your goals. That's not a bad thing. I think for a campaign as open ended as Rogue Trader, that's a really good structure to add to it. But I think there might be better ways to to measure the achievements that you're gaining from each of those things. Because all those Cubicle Seven for Warhammer games since then, like. Soulbound and Wrath and Glory and Warhammer Fantasy Fourth and Imperium Maledictum, you have goals, right? Short-term goals, long-term goals. And as you achieve those, you get XP. And that might be a way of doing that stuff, of, of rewarding you directly from that, uh, of having, oh, like, so there is a tangible reward and there's a little bit of an incentive structure for setting goals for yourself and working towards those things. But, uh, and then in a, a uh, longer term way, we would take like those steps towards the long term endeavor. The smaller steps give you XP bonuses. The long term things give you a big fat, you know, XP reward at the end of an adventure. Um, that might be a more effective way of doing that rather than having some other cockamamie currency that we're arbitrarily adding numbers to and arbitrarily achieving, you know, not arbitrarily, there is structure to it too. It's just, uh, I think the XP is a, is a real, you know, um, the universal currency for this kind of game, except for the mm -hmm. profit factor. So that me that would leave profit factor having a, an issue. And I think it does a good enough way of, of handling the um, acquisitions. But I'm going to take a look at how Imperium Maledictum handles it because it's a D100 based game. Because that one also has a patron and you're kind of calling on the patron to access different uh, things. And I think that might be a more interesting way to to handle profit factor um, than what it is right now, where it's just, it's, yeah. Um, I think of how it, like Wrath and Glory also has, I think, a, a really interesting way of using uh, the, it's similar to this game where it intends to be for both purchasing things and for, um, influencing people because of that that is something that you can do with your profit factor in this but it's disconnected from this whole like setting up your campaign structure stuff so yeah so i don't know man i i'm thinking out loud here with it and uh, i've already mentioned before my issues with the endeavor system on stream so this is just me rehashing uh, an old thing but i recall too that there's um and i'm i'm I think it's this one. There's an adventure, Lure of the Expanse. Have you looked at that? It, yeah, that's I actually, see, yeah. That. I see just from the title, Grim Adventures of Profit and Peril. There you go. Yeah, very yeah. good. Does not, it, it does not, div, d, 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 does not um, divert okay. from any of the other ones. And just to be clear too, that doesn't mean the Endeavor thing being bolted onto it is I think the only yeah. way you run a pre-gen adventure in this game that has that. The fact that we are ignoring it and have been playing for like, I don't think, you, you, it doesn't sound like you guys have felt that you're missing out on that part of the game thus far. Am I incorrect in that or? Yeah, no, I mean, the only way I, w I really wasn't, uh, at least maybe since the very beginning, I, I took a look and I, you know, I don't remember much of what I, I kind of skimmed at the time. Um, mainly, I think about it just just from the um, the surface of, um, I was thinking of the way that I already mentioned that, you know, oh, you know, if we need something, you know, it's, it's one of the ways we do that, that, you know, we look yeah. for something for a better weapon for so-and-so and, -so and yeah. you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and it's also kind of like, I mean, I get the game balance reason of it too, but it's weird. It's as you're already making an odd decision about scarcity by saying, okay, you can call on this, but you can call on it for one thing. You've absolutely unlimited uh, resources to try and acquire almost anything <laughs> from a starship cannon to a fucking yeah. set of, uh, you know, high-tech armor, but you get one pull of the lever. Yeah, you know, uh, and I mean, like, there's got to be a point where you got that game. The game balance has to step in and say, like, okay, you, you know, you can't just have everything. Um, yeah, but you're already putting a weird set of arbitrary rules on it, so it's just a decision of what arbitrary rules you're choosing to play with. And it'd be worth looking at because um, uh, Death Watch has a similar thing, but they gate stuff behind your tiers how further up in like in experience and how further up in uh, like um recognition or whatnot that you're in uh that get governs what you can draw on to to fill your you know your gear and whatnot 
I don't think that translates directly here because you guys wouldn't, you, there's not like an, uh, there isn't a similar kind of like official hierarchy within uh, you guys, uh, the way there is with the Space Marine, you know, Space Marines of uh, Death Watch, but it's a different way of managing the exact same problem of like, well, why can't we have this shit, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So here's a question that kind of relates to what we're talking about, maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, so it, in our advancements, we, we improve our characters, but we also take the crew on with us periodically. Are there ways to advance the crew so that as the adventures presumably get harder and we bring crew with us or assign tasks to them, that the crew doesn't fall back and become less and less competent? Yeah, um, I don't have an official i don't remember there being anything about that but i think it might be under the starship we haven't had to or i haven't had to look at the starship uh uh construction stuff since we first started playing um but let me well, take to a be look fair, also they couldn't become less competent <laughs> well if the this, this, well yeah but if, a, if the competency stays the same and the difficulty goes up then they seemingly become less competent yeah, I know you're just being funny, James. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is. Well, I've been taking too. our armsmen down into the into the local barn and seeing if they can hit it once I put them inside it. But so far, they haven't. No, <laughs> they yeah, are like, quite incompetent in most cases. There are some games where they have like, here we go. So all ships start with a competent crew with a skill level of thirty. The cost of a crew is included with a ship. Um, you can upgrade your crew to a crack crew by spending five of your existing ship points. Mm. And they may even upgrade them to a veteran crew by spending 15 ship points. And let's see how ship points translate to profit factor. Or if I'm missing that. Carrying over the all important last se you know sentence in a paragraph thing. That's funny that crack is lower than veteran. Yeah, that's kind of funny. Mm. Okay, construction. Maybe that's like crew members on crack. <laughs> <laughs> so they're just like really high energy for a little while, and then they just totally pass out. Okay, so thirty-three is the ship points. Uh, like ship points are your starting. Ship points and your profit Two. factor. Here we go, ship. Any ship points that are not spent are added directly to your profit factor. I wonder if you can spend, hold on, I wonder if you can translate profit factor directly over to ship points. That's how you, that becomes the sink for it. Truly, this is an entire campaign effectively of us learning the game on stream. <laughs> Best way. Best way. It's gotta yeah. be riveting, come on. Yeah, was, <laughs> there's some road trader veteran out there who's just screaming, <laughs> "Fuck!" <Yeah. laughs> what? Right. Uh, okay, so awards are bonuses, endeavors. All right, so let me see about ship points, mm -mm 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 -mm. commerce and acquisitions. only one yeah it's an acquisition check to acquire uh ships as well hmm. that's where that commerce skill i have comes in play because that there, it talks about using an acquisition check yeah huh yeah i just um Like I get the what what I guess I'm the my issue with the yeah it doesn't so to answer the question it doesn't seem like you can convert profit factor over directly so you would always have to be making acquisitions uh, from it and the modifier that you make to your acquisition role would be related to the uh, cost the ship point cost of the different components including upgrading your crew so you guys can do that and this is the thing that I struggle with in the game is like well then when the fuck does profit factor go down like is it just continually on a upward trajectory apart from the um, misfortunes that might come up and is that because there aren't like 
I have not seen any adventures that I've read so far where it's like, and then this happens and your profit factor goes down by X. It may be so in there uh, in some of these that I just did not see. Um, so but it's not costing you profit factor to make an acquisition. No. You'd think that like, oh, we got a profit factor to six and now we're making a ship acquisition of costing us two profit factor. Right. Our profit factor drops back down to four, but we've got a nicer ship. Right? Yeah, and like there are ways, I, th I, I can't remember if I'm confusing Wrath and Glory with this one, but there are ways to sort of like reduce temporarily your influence by really trying to get something, you know? Mm. But um, rules is written because we've gone through these acquisition rules. Like every time we make a purchase, we're always scratching our heads at this these rules um, and maybe it's not a, an issue that your profit factor never goes down but it feels like then every campaign would be on uh, unless the DM puts their thumb on the scale and has reasons for you bleeding your profit factor and I guess that's the thing is that the, the losses of profit factor do not seem to be connected to any story elements the way that they're trying to set the increases in profit factor so I just don't know. Um, here we go. Unusual acquisitions. Uh, let's see here. That Eldar ghost ship you wanted, Quinelli? <laughs> exactly. What is your profit factor currently, actually, guys? I don't even know. Is it on your no, ship? No clue, to be honest. <laughs> Colton. Yeah, like I feel like is let's see because it will be it, like, it would be great to have clear ways of you 56. guys 56 56 56 okay yeah that's actually really not all that high relatively speaking um it's like I I think of how money plays a role in our traveler campaign for instance and it is really fucking interesting. There's clear reasons in the same way that you guys have talked about uh, the incentive of getting XP. There's clear incentives of like, now I've got X amount of credits. Now we can do something, you know, like the first time that uh, we just had the first time for the uh, crew to upgrade their ship. We played um, almost a year or maybe a little bit more than a, almost a year, I think, uh, with the ship having no weaponry. There were pirates in that game too. So it was not a matter of it. So when they when that came up to that point and they were able to make those investments, it was a very cool campaign moment because it was something they yeah. built towards. It was a really satisfying thing. And there was an ownership of um, customizing the, the vessel in the same way that you would customize your characters. And it would be awesome if we could figure a way of doing that effectively in this game where you guys have more ownership over, like you said, the crew, um, the various things that are on there. Um, I just don't know if A, like we have the benefit in in that game of one of our players in that one, Graham, is the ship's quartermaster, which means he does all the math. And that takes a lot of the heavy lifting away from the rest of the crew. Yeah. Is that something that you guys feel has been like the it's in the latter half of the first year of this campaign that we started focusing more on the crew itself and on your role within the crew and started having adventures on the ship, you know, on those lower quarters. Would you like to see more of that, of the, the developing the Mortis Probati um, and the crew on there in the like setting out the story considerations? I mean, just strictly the stats of them. Is that something that's important to you? To, to see develop as well, or is it more the big picture story stuff that is the focus? I mean, we've relied on the crew a bit at times for sure. If our crew got bumped, I, I assume the metric is their test. Uh, there may be something else that I'm not aware yeah. of, but if it, you know, if it went above 30, I think we'd like that. Like that'd be something worthwhile that um, uh, like, like I think all of, I, I even, thought i felt like all of us when you just said oh you can get a crack crew and we're like what you know let's where, where was that we could have used that a couple of times you know that kind of a thing where yeah, yeah. um it's worthwhile you know it's uh it's good it'd be good on the menu if that's on the menu so that's the thing and if yeah, it's yeah. not and that'll happen in our next uh set of acquisitions when you guys are back on uh, footfall so let me yeah and we don't necessarily need to use the mechanic that's in the game if we don't want to use profit factor we could just 
you can just figure out like, okay, well, this is how much the DC is going up as you go through these adventures. This is how much we need to involve the crew. Then we need to find a way that get, you know, advance the crew periodically so that they don't lag oh. behind and. Yeah, uh, the, uh, or the, there's the um, uh, Richard Nerfus, of course, but the a Star Trek Adventures one where you can use your experience points to improve your crew, mm -hmm. your alt mm -hmm. characters. Well, once because you, you can't really improve yourself in that game, you can modify yourself, but you can instead do it to make your mm -hmm. uh, alt characters better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's... Um... Hmm. That's an interesting point too about the ex like the the focus beyond our our crew, uh, our bridge crew as it were. So I was looking for whether uh, for the number so the numbers of acquisitions it says is up to the GM. Um, as a general rule, you should restrict access to appropriate junctures and to downtime between plays, such as the start or the beginning of a session. Uh, for important or longer things, you may also have to complete a series of in-game conditions. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Explorers should be able to, to buy personal weapons, armor, gear, <clears throat> as often as they like, provided they have access uh, <coughs> excuse me, to the goods they seek and, and the time to acquire them. If an explorer fails an acquisition test, then it's up to the GM to decide when uh, he makes that again. Um, it may be access to different resources or markets. So, yeah, the rules are extremely loose on how to judge that. It's like, well, you can make them as often as you want, and if they fail it, maybe it means the others can't acquire it, or maybe it means that that one couldn't acquire it. So, it's the lack of, um, I guess, like the, the the answer to that is just I need to make a decision on how uh, clearly we want to make use of it. Because I think yeah. tying it as a a clear benefit um, that you can get from your adventures. If it's only fifty six, you got a, <coughs> a lot of runway to go. <coughs> Excuse me, as far as increasing your profit factor is concerned. Right, like, you know, especially if there's going to be vicissitudes over the course of play. Um, maybe what we do then is our next session, your first little bit on um, on footfall, we drill down into those rules a little bit further and spend some time uh, doing some acquisition and upgrading the ship and, you know, improving the crew and whatever, make some rolls, and we'll see what comes from that. Yeah. Yeah, and I was kind of already thinking that way. I didn't know what it would entail or how how far we go with it. But just for equipment, I was already thinking that way. You know, this is our chance to, uh, you know, kind of bone up a little bit, buff, yeah. buff, buff equipment a little bit. Well, and that's the thing that I find is frustrating with it is that it, and um, I don't know what the answer is to, to address it, but like in comparison to um, like a sandbox style, you know, a fantasy game or um, or ro or uh, our sandbox traveler game. There's a clear, like, I have X amount of cash and I can buy Y amount of goods with it. Yeah, so there's a cool yeah. kind of like, oh, okay, this is direct, you know, it directly translates into that sweet, like, at the end of the adventure, here's some sweet fat loot I get, whether it's the shit you found or the shit you purchased with your, you know, ill-gotten or, you know, um, legitimately uh, gotten gains. In this game, such a weird abstraction between it and such incremental increases that there isn't that same payoff to it. And again, like with scale of wealth that you guys have access to, that kind of makes sense. There, it wouldn't be logical that it's there, but I don't know. Yeah, and I, I see here too, I, this may have been what you were looking at, uh, I, the acquisition page, but it talks about it as a plot device. That's interesting. You know, yeah, I think maybe that's what you're referring to. Just yeah, ago, it's, Kevin. Like it's just, it's like, well, make of it whatever the fuck you want. And like, that's, that's it's okay. Cr right. It's, it's fine advice. And right. I think for a, a, a wide open game like this, that's fine. Why right. bother having that goddamn mechanic then? Yeah. If yeah. it's all yeah. just, you know, like, and I don't mean to pick on the game because it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do. But like, if you're going to have something like that, 
and it's going to be contingent on the actions of the characters, it should have some feedback yeah. to it then that is tangible yeah, yeah. and understandable to the thing. And there's so yeah. many other games that do such a good job of it. It just feels Maybe like... a table even. You know, give us a table or something to, you know... You, know... you could even just have in the adventures that, you know, completing certain types of quests provide you with a certain amount of additional profit factor and then... But that's got a cap back. on it. Here, the problem is, is that like that's got to be limited at a certain time to only right, but then but then you just turn profit factor is as a as a grand term is used to to buy off of a chart similar to buying weapons and equipment off of a chart with gold profit factor is big picture stuff like ships and crew because <laughs> you're not going to go and buy yeah 30 000 you know, handguns for your crew you're See, I don't think it'll. It, I don't think it can translate to Rocky that way. Uh, partly because like, you just need to buy stuff. What what it feels like is that they're trying to give a, a random ad, like a, add a loose game mechanic to the availability components of things. And, like if you make if you fail your profit factor, it doesn't mean that you didn't afford it because your your family has incalculable wealth. It means you just can't acquire it. So it's supposed to be influ It's supposed to be representing the influence and the ability to purchase, not just the credits. But it still yeah. feels like the, I don't know. It's, I, I can tell you it is the most, that part of the game is the thing I get tripped up on the most when I'm planning it. Because like the setting, the characters, the game mechanics, other than this, are things I love about this game. And it's so good yeah. to hear that you guys were in, like how much you were enjoying the, the ability to expand your characters. I can tell you the biggest frustration for me in this campaign has been those rules because I'm, I really struggle with not only the way we, we tend to play campaigns, which is fairly slow, you know, a lot slower than what uh, other games will, but also that there's not a real clear way in my mind to key like and now you come back and here's a representation of your achievement i gotta look online i haven't looked in fairness online about any kind of house rules for this so it's possible that there someone has you know already had the same issue with these mechanics and come up with a, a an alternative but i'll this also oh go ahead sean go ahead so no sorry i interrupted you go ahead. no it's i'm saying the same thing over and over again in a different way <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's kind of interesting here this frequency of acquisition on page 272 it's still kind of loosey-goosey yeah, that's it what i'm saying like, it's just it is. that's yeah, what i was reading out like it's just like meh do yeah. it whatever you want yeah get right. whatever you want but then there's these rigid rules for like you know you get x amount of profit factor at the end of uh an endeavor and you get a certain amount that's spread out across the smaller parts of it and then you also got to yeah. get uh achievement points over the course of your thing like it just in comparison right. to the and Death Watch came after this too, but like Death, Death Watch's like uh, achievement points is great. I think it's a really, really clever uh, way oh. of, of adding a little bit of meta structure to uh, that game's got a ton of meta structures in it anyway, with the squad rules and the individual rules. But that's a really clever one for for the, that. And I'd like to have something similar in here because it should be something that is a risk, and it is something that should be. A, um, uh, it should be something that you guys are directly rewarded for over the course of your, uh, or, or, you know, see setbacks in over the course of your adventures, because that's what you guys are yeah. do partly doing, right? It's trying to build your, your, uh, campaign. But, yep. uh, I just, it's such a yeah. loosey goosey way of, of. It says here, it should not become a stumbling block every time an explorer wants to find a new suit of flak armor. It does kind of, it just, it just leaves the GM out there. I know, it's like, like figure it, it out. matters, but it doesn't matter. And it does. It's, right. it's like, why have all these, uh, you know, all these, this, Loose this discussion? Ends. Like, you know, you're just leaving too much on the well, GM's it's, plate. It's not to only that, out. but like, that's, what, that, like, that's where the rubber meets the road. Because the, at the, at the whole point of the Endeavor system or the, uh, the Endeavor system and whatnot, is to gain profit factor but the profit factor doesn't seem to fucking matter apart from it just yeah. being an arbitrary number that sometimes goes up you know and it's like yeah but and it was no limitation and again like that clearly it, they kept it they didn't change it afterwards and i've not heard anyone expressly call that out as a problem so it's just it's a problem of how i structure adventures and how i run adventures and you know our table and this mechanic uh, just to save yeah. some angry uh, postings for it, but it's a, <laughs> I can tell you it's it's a thing that is routinely um, set like uh, I, I there's a lot of reasons I love lot of our time we've spent with Wrath and Glory as well, but one of the things that I really dislike about running Road Trader is that fucking mechanic. 
I find it so limiting and so poorly defined that I just don't know what the fuck I'm supposed to do with it. And right. I, if bef I'm, I'm happy to throw it out altogether, but I want there to be some structure to how you're buying things and how you're able to develop your ship. And I guess like the other thing, this is another question for you too, is we've had one ship ship combat session thus far. Ship ship combat is where characters like Jeff's, like Alessander and the captain really kind of come into their own. Um, Rogers, you have some things to do, but you're not really, it's traveling long distances is really your shtick, I think. Um, and Godwin, does, I'm not sure you've got much to do at all uh, during ship ship combat. Uh, but is that something you guys feel is like, boy, we should have more of that? Uh, or is the ship a, I think the travel rules, we'll talk about it in a moment. Um, the travel rules are an important part that's add a lot of flavor to this campaign. But is the ship ship combat, is that something that you feel should be part of this type of campaign? Or is the ship a, the shit, a setting in the same way that it would be in games that don't bother to flesh that shit out? Can we answer I'd that after we once in a while? <laughs> what, what's that, Dave? Can we answer that after we upgrade the crew to veterans? <laughs> 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 What'd you say, James? Sorry. Yeah, I think it, it fits once in a while. But, uh, you know, as you say, the trouble with ship-to-ship -ship combat, like most games, is <laughs> it, uh, it can lead to a TPK with little in a few roles yeah yeah I, w I wouldn't say i'm like craving ship combat as much as um but but if but if it but if it fits like the story i think it'd be great like you know once in a while i mean basically what you know what james just said that that um that uh i mean i'm not i'm not necessarily uh craving let's say for us to like start pirating ships one after another or something like yeah, that yeah. but but if it comes up you know it, it, we mean we're going to be excited like it doesn't happen very it hasn't happened very often so if all of a sudden we're like oh shit Once. like we're about to like yeah, yeah yeah so if you know so the next time it happens we're going to be like ooh, whoa whoa you know we're about to get into here it comes you know we're about to get in combat and get in the ship i think it'll be exciting because of that you know mm -hmm. too that uh Cause be, that, I think it'll be fun. Because um, that, I mean, the, the travel mechanic is, is a separate thing to talk about in a moment, but like the only, right now, the travel the travel mechanic is the only way that really the the ship, the qualities on the ship ever come up. Right? That like we don't have, right. there's nothing else that uh, is part of the ship uh, rules that comes up that is, um, that is part Without of combat, the- combat, you mean. Oh, sorry? Without combat, you mean? Without, Without combat, uh, yeah. <clears throat> like with the, yeah. In combat, that's where all those things, like your maneuverability and your sensors yeah, or yeah. whatever else, all that shit comes into play. But yeah. um, right now, it, the only time it, the ship ever matters is uh, your crew rating uh, and your um, the Wraithbone hull because it benefits uh, Regis. He gets to yeah, read yeah. those double encounters. Yeah. Oh, and so I don't want to change the ship. <laughs> I can't imagine why. <laughs> Listen, we're, we're over our mid session. Why don't we take our mid session break right now? Then we'll come back and talk about Regis's time in the spotlight, the travel rules. Sound good? Well, okay. yeah. So, yep. for those listening at home, we'll be back momentarily.
All right. Mm. I think we're almost so. Oh, it's waiting for Dave here. Yeah, that's great to hear about um, the way you guys have felt about XP in the game too. That seems to be a universally accepted thing. Uh, it's a lesson to be drawn for other games, definitely. Yeah. I'm also hearing a little bit of support for uh, uh, um, a Death Watch uh, game at uh, at some point. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so uh the one of the game uh, mechanics that has worked uh or at least has been i, I shouldn't say i, I don't want to presuppose your answers to this but that has um played a pretty big role in our campaign has been the travel rules out of um the uh oh gosh what is it um the afterpath book whatever it's called uh i don't remember offhand primer Right, Navigator's Nav Primer. Yeah, the, uh, Navis Primer. Navis Primer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a what well, fucking great book. Um, yeah. yeah. So that I think let's, let's start with uh, James. What what has your been uh, your experience with that? How have you felt uh, that those rules have uh, given how have functioned? I guess for for your character's role as a navigator. It's good. Well, definitely, the Wraithbone Hull helped. And then later, with the being able to share fate points when we were having that incredibly long journey, because otherwise I'd have been toast. Yeah. Because I, I really need to. Keep, if I think we're going to travel, I have to make sure I have fate points stored for any travel. Yeah. That's one of the things that, um, like in in a game, any ship game has this issue, right? Like sh a ship based thing where. Um, there are going to be parts where certain people will just be much more important in, in certain roles of it. And it's um, a lot of games have struggled to try and figure out ways to have everybody involved. And I, I think that the, the most effective ones that do that are ones where they just set roles for the characters to fill. Like the Star Trek games, it's clear what you're doing on it. If you're playing the counselor by choice, um, you're not getting involved in Star Trek. No, it's not true. Because in certain Star Trek games, you still have something you can do on a, um, on like an inspirational kind of thing, like a D&D &D bard style, like adding bonus dice for people to do things with. So, you know, some games uh, handle that pretty well. This does not, but neither does Traveler for that matter. Like Traveler, if you, there are specific roles that are, really helpful and necessary in Starship Combat, but if you don't fill those roles, you don't really contribute anything to the to those scenes. It's not a bad thing, it's just me, it's a practicality of, of the of the um uh the you know more free form kind of uh campaign structure for it. Uh, a starship that has a dedicated crew like in Star Trek kind of way everybody in that setting is going to have a specific role to play probably in starship combat and the rules just reflect that kind of campaign structure in this alessandra has got lots to do in starship combat red just does captain aquari does to a degree godwin's kind of left in the cold for <laughs> what to do during that but the travel the and the, the converse is it puts an enormous amount of um like it's it's a I, I, I don't think I would necessarily change it. And I think our fix for it by having uh, more fate points go to you has, has worked uh, for it. But like uh, that definitely, it, it's, it puts all of the skill checks on your shoulders, right? Like there's nothing that anyone else is doing to help out with like, um, yeah, yeah we, we've had in, I'm using Traveler as the comparison here, uh, largely because we've got an ongoing Traveler campaign at the same time that involves travel the lead up to the jump involves multiple members of the crew it's not just one person who's making all their roles at the same time whereas for the warp which i imagine feels pretty special as well as putting a lot of you know a demand on uh, your narrative meta currency uh, no and why i've got my um warp navigation up to 81 <laughs> percent it, it is kind of necessary <laughs> or else we're all going to have a bad time yeah yeah <laughs> yeah do you feel that that leaves you wanting in other areas or do you feel like you no no uh, i don't mind that it's uh it's uh that's what he does right he's a navigator so yeah. that should be his thing so, yeah uh, yeah 
What about the rest that's, of you guys? Uh, that's cool. How the the like have the um, setting aside the excitement of the, what's affecting the entire ship. Um, how do you guys feel about those travel rules? Because in some you know, a, an uncharitable way of, of describing would be that you guys basically have nothing to do except for make saves during that as things might go wrong. But And berate Regius if he doesn't do his job. My goodness. <laughs> well, I don't... Godwin doesn't have a lot to do during the tests uh, and that travel, but, you know, if we have, like, uh, crew members who are affected by it i can help thin the herd if necessary you know like <laughs> he has skills that come into play afterwards mm -hmm. but uh yeah that's all right he, he has a different role on this ship and he his time to shine is at a different times mm -hmm. it's, i'm whatever in a, a difficult position to judge it because i'm whatever set of roles you guys are engaging with i'm engaging with right so I find them really interesting, and I think there's a lot of neat and unexpected things that come up over the course of it, but none of that directly affects uh, or can be affected by anyone other than Regis. Right, right. So, and again, like, it, if it's, um, I, it doesn't happen all the time. You guys aren't constantly doing that stuff, and we've now seen what the worst outcome, barring you guys blowing up, really can be. We've seen a critical yeah. failure where you guys spent 262 days or whatever it was in the war. Right. And I don't know. I mean, like, I, it took us two sessions to get through that travel. I found it a, a good opportunity for me as the DM to add stuff in that I wouldn't have otherwise yeah. done, right? Like, that was doing more than what was in the, you know, rules as written. But it was kind of neat to be able to be like, okay, we're going to do... 20 days or whatever or whatever what the description was and then have you know um a vignette where something's going to happen you guys are going to do something and then more time and then we're going to jump in yeah i thought it's going pretty pretty well i mean i could see optimally that we'd have that each of us or more of us would have more to do but um it's kind of quick and dirty too like it's not you know if you had if you know with the ship combat the problem um is that it could last a while and if you don't have anything to do for a while then that's kind of an issue right yeah. but if it's quick and dirty ah uh, you know it's it's not that big a deal like you know hey we're traveling this is you know we're, we do so we do a roll or three you know the regius takes care of and we're all kind of biting our nails a little bit you know he's got a high chance so it's it should be fine which i think is good because mm -hmm. most of the time you know we've probably got something to do you know, so you, if if your ship was constantly just just bouncing off planets, you know, you can't get anywhere. You know, it'd be kind of a, you know, you'd, it'd be kind of a, it would start getting a little bonkers. You know, so you really ought to be able to get somewhere once in a while. So mm. it's good that his, you know, his chances are high and he does his thing, and it, and it doesn't take long. You know, so it's really I don't think it's that big a deal because of the um, the scope of the uh, subsystem. Yeah, is um is is very is time constrained. So next thing you know, he's done his thing, and we kind of move on. You know, if it if it took half a session, that would be different. But um, it doesn't. You know, no. I think the um having spent two sessions with that really long trip, again, that being assuming that's going to be the outlier for your travel experiences, that makes that one I think feel really different. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Agreed. I I find that the warp the time in the warp has led to some really interesting role play and storytelling and whatnot. So the fact that it's Regius's thing and that's where his skills matter, I don't think really matters as far as the way the game plays, because mm -hmm. it is an important time for all of us. Like um, it's been quite the time for my character. I mean, Alessandra's had a lot of trouble in the in the warp, so <laughs> yes, to speak. Yes. Like, you know, it, yeah. it is interesting for him. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and I, and I think that's like uh, of the however much I, I, I did, I really didn't want to just uh, spend time complaining about the game mechanics. Uh, so I'm glad we did that in the middle of the thing. 
um, because I, I think that the travel mechanics, I, I, from the GM's perspective, I absolutely love them. Like, I think there's so many interesting potential outcomes. I don't think it's a yeah. single. I, I really like that it's not, um, oh, you've made one bad roll and that's the whole trip. I like that it's a series of cascading things that often feed into one another. So the there are redundancies against having just dog shit one roll, you know, one dog shit roll that just affects your entire trip. Um, right. There are what things that will make it more difficult or, you know, whatever. So they're evocative, like you say, Jeff, but they're not singularly determinative in one roll of like, well, we're just screwed for the entire trip now. Even that long trip, like the, the bad outcome from that was that it was a long time. It wasn't that it was also more dangerous or whatever else, right? Yeah, uh, you need so. a series of dog shit rolls and re rolls in order to. Really... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Which is why rare. Piling all that weight on James because, you know, then that's his. Right. Yeah. Dog like, pile on you're... the navigator. <laughs> yeah, James, you're in charge of extended weather rolls, really, is what Kevin's doing to you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it is extended weather rolls because it adds, yeah, it makes travel a, a really interesting and, and evocative thing. Like, what other game do you have, uh, Starship Travel game, do you have such, you know, um, incredibly interesting setting, you know, uh, things that are very evocative of the setting uh, that that play into every time you guys go through a travel? You know, like, there's yeah. just... This is even, it's even, um, I, I, now I'm, I'm suddenly deja vuing to uh, this subject, which is a little different. But I wondered how far to take it in Dark Heresy, since it's even mm -hmm. less. Really, the crews, the the team is just getting a ride most of the time, and so you know, unlike Rogue Trader, it's our ship. You know, we're we're kind of we're kind of piloty, shippy people. You know, we got a navigator, we got a pilot. Mm -hmm. In Dark Heresy, that's not the case at all. I mean, it might be, but it's unusual. Like you're not focused on ship stuff. Um, it's, yeah. it's just different. It's a it's an investigation, combaty sort of social team, not a ship team. So they're just getting a ride. And I remember um, wondering how far to take it in for that reason of, uh, and I remember looking at Navigate, you know, Navis Primer, which is such a great book and mm -hmm. you're bringing it back. This is bringing it back for me of, of thinking, um, if everyone, is everyone gonna be pissed? You know, yeah. if we start going wildly into the ship direction, you know, because because just travel goes wrong, you know, and, and they and they they have nothing to do with it. There is no navigator. Like they're they're just sitting there in the in the passenger seats, you know, go, you know, not wanting anything bad to happen. And so it's kind of a, it was a little, it was even more so than we're discussing now, you know, from, yeah. uh, but anyway, that's, yeah. that's the setting though, though, right? Cause, cause you ships go missing in the warp ship. Yeah. You know, yeah. Stuff goes right. bad. And that's why you're looking for your granddad's ship and all the treasure. Like that's, that's literally yeah. the story and the setting built right into it. So yeah, it's definitely yeah, yeah. A, a point where the game mechanics in, uh, in the overall kind of, uh, the, pace of play stuff um, really feeds back into the theme of the of the game. I, I think they're some of my favorite travel mechanics of uh, uh, of any game that I've seen. It's interesting that they have not, um, I, I, I can understand why they wouldn't want to have ship combat in any of the new games yet. Um, because like once you open the door for ship combat, you need to have just a shit ton of options for people to pick from and have different varieties of ships and whatnot, or you're gonna be facing the same things over and over again. It ha yeah. ship co construction has to go hand in hand with that stuff. Um, Mongoose pub uh, learned that after when they published uh, the second edition of Traveler without uh, ship building rules, and then had to oh. release a second version of the second edition book with those in it a couple of years later. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that game, there's always, High Guard has always been sort of, if you're going to use a lot of ship construction, there's a separate book you buy for it. But um, but the, the thing is, is that uh, while you may not have a ship ship combat, the travel component of it feels like something that is definitely missing from some of those other games because it is such an, and I guess they, you don't have uh, navigator player characters in either uh, Imperium Maledictum or Wrath and Glory yet. But uh, so you don't have a player who's interacting with those rules, but they're really some of my favorite new rules that I've, I've seen in the game. Uh, so I'm glad to hear that uh, 
you're enjoying them, James, and I'm glad to hear that the crew is not feeling like it's, um, you know, they're going along to someone else's dance. It's not really the right well, analogy, well, but it's Friday yeah, night. It's, uh, I think uh, Sean's right. It doesn't drag, uh, you know, apart from when you've got a 250-day journey, it doesn't drag too much. Yeah. Yeah, and it's worth. I can't remember if we did it on stream or we did it afterwards. But we like for those listening at home, if we did do it off uh, afterwards, after we rolled that result, we all talked about like, okay, how are we going to handle this? Do right. we, you know, yeah, flub if we the rules? It, out, it could have been like months and months of. Travel. Yeah, and that's something that I like. Why I've been struggling with this other part of it is because in that that was a case where. I always prefer to be like, all right, let's trust the rules as written for now. We'll see how it plays out because we haven't tried it. And then we'll make an adjustment from, uh, you know, if we need to afterwards. And it turned out it was really manageable, right? Like we had, uh, it was a pretty long list to get through, but for going through whatever it was, 46 weeks of travel, it didn't feel that, it felt like it moved along at a pretty good clip. Like it wasn't an unmanageable yeah. number that it appeared to be when we first rolled it. Yeah, it, it was a good call by you too, uh, for you to do it, for you not to do it. Like we just come in and just and and make rolls, like mm. individually. That would have taken so much longer. It was a good idea for you to just. So I'm, you know, when you said I'm going to do this in between sessions, I'm going to bang it all out, and then and then and then that lets you that you know as as usual like the you know the, the GM then has a good chance if the GM has a good handle on it like he knows what's up because if because if we just rolled everyone individually that's just that that in, that intrinsically is going to take a lot longer and the GM doesn't know what's coming so he's got to come up with stuff over and over and over like on the fly yeah and that's a that's a heavy lift so instead you know with the GM doing it in between sessions gets a look at the whole thing and says okay like I've I've I've, I've got an idea like this is yeah. what we're gonna do and then it's fine Th then then it can like it, you know like what happened you know it can it can go so you know what might be in, in the spirit of that you know what might be an interesting way of approaching um the profit factor thing instead of having to do it the way that the rule book says where it's like you know here's your you you pick one endeavor when we go through that thing um Ugh, I'm second guessing it already because I'm like, yeah, but then it, it's going to push the, like, we're either going to play the adventure that's pre-written as kind of our next, you know, leg of this, uh, or we're going to come up with your own thing and, and pursue that. Uh, what I was going to say is, is instead of having it set towards a specific objective, each of you guys figure out like a long-term goal you want to work towards, and then using the achievement towards each of those as a way of calculating up your achievement points to play back into your or to, to play back into your profit factor but if we're going to play a pre-written adventure you're going to be dri you might be like i'm going to get involved in x and then we don't see x for you know a year again so it's like well you're you're outside of that that's not an insurmountable problem because we worked like we're working with that in our warhammer uh for, for uh, fantasy uh campaign uh as well but um Um, but maybe what I would be interested in hearing uh, between now and next session too is what you guys are thinking of as terms of your individual goals. Like are there things you yeah. want to achieve on the ship or things you want to achieve for yourself personally? You're all on a ship uh, under the you know um, rubric of a rogue trading dynasty. So there there is uh, some limitations there, but... Um, it would be interesting just to, to see if there are individual specific goals. And I mean, in the specific tangible way too, right? Like of, um, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, Cause that would be a good way of, of dealing with that. I think like our next adventure is gonna be, I think fairly self-evident as to what the pre-written path is, but uh, you know, and I guess that's the question too, like I, I, I that's what I was sort of prepping. Do you guys want to do that, or do you want to find your own thing? Because like I can, the the game and the setting is flexible enough that I can certainly find, you know, my my own. Uh, I can find ways to make the the campaign interesting, and I, I like having curveballs thrown anyway. So, what do you guys think? I mean, I I tend to like. I mean, I've heard especially games like this. 
I, um, I'll, I'll have heard of adventures. And so I'll think, oh, that'd be cool to like, you know, get a little taste of, yeah. of um, you know, a, 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 um, an over the top example is like, you know, murder on the Orient or horror on the 100%. Orient Express. You yeah. know, you're like, ooh, playing horror. Like that's, that's a big deal. You know, that kind of a thing yeah. where you're like, yeah, let's, let's do that. Like, let's tackle that sucker. You know, let's, uh, so that kind of, I, I get, I get some of that excitement. And so, and I've known about, uh, roughly, because I hadn't played, haven't played Rogue Trader before, but uh, I've seen those adventures sitting around forever, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I would, uh, it, I think it'd be fun to get a little, get a little taste. Yeah. Okay. Well, the rest of you guys, feel free to disagree with management. It's fine. <laughs> but we always do. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, behind my back, though. Whether yeah. whether or not we actually voice that opinion. Just kidding. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I jokingly sent Kev a message saying I want to start a cult. Ha -ha. <laughs> <laughs> also, just kidding, because I really don't want to start a cult. That's the last thing on Godwin's mind. Mm. But, as far um, as we know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave but, did just um, send me another message saying he's not joking, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to believe now. You know, stories within <laughs> stories. <laughs> well, it's got to start with the misinformation and then give everybody yeah, yeah. that misinformation as alibi right mm -hmm. of course why would i want to start a cult and then tell everybody that i was going to start a cult that would be just right. like setting myself crazy up for, yeah yeah it's terrible insane but um um yeah next leg of the like things to explore in the campaign i, I feel like the Corona's Expanse is just so vast and there's so much going on there that we've just started to explore that, you know, I, I don't feel that we're starved for things to look into. I mean, yeah. I know the other stuff that's come up with our little side adventure that we're going to have to deal with and, um, you know, even just dealing with, you know, like picking up some of the items we want for our characters and just like sort of the basic stuff of the game. There's still a lot there to explore mm -hmm. without um, worrying too much about, you know, what comes next, basically. Yeah. James, any thoughts one way or the other? No, no, no. I'm good with that. So, yeah, I mean, I think the... Um, the way that our, like, if you look at it with your eyes kind of fuzzed out, our first adventure is very much like how the adventure as written was. I made a few changes in it, but like, for the most part, we follow the same beats that are in that one. Um, that's probably how I would run the pre-written adventures as well, just because that's how I tend to run all of them. One of the advantages of the pre-written adventures is that uh, there are some, you know, uh, it, it plays the hits, as it were. You know, like there there are the clear things. I would probably do that in, uh, you know, something separate anyway. Um, but it, it's nice that those, uh, like the, each of the adventures incorporates some really, some absolutely great stuff. I will say that the, of the things that are included in the pre-made adventures, I probably like the Rogue Trader ones best of the ones I've read. Um, the only war ones are the ones that appeal. I, I, I just the whole chaos thing for Black Crusade doesn't appeal to me at all. But the only war stuff is probably the least appealing to me. Death Watch stuff is pretty cool. It's got some great stuff in there. But the Rogue Trader stuff is the stuff that I really think is is super fucking cool in terms of like the 40k content. So there's a lot of yeah. great stuff to find in those pre-written adventures. And um, yeah, okay. So that that. I uh, I don't know if any of them tie into this, but one of the coolest pieces of things or coolest events that happened to us in this entire first campaign, I think, was discovering that we had those Eldar soul gems built into the hull of the Mortis Probati. Like, because we, we spent a fair bit of time in a couple of sessions talking about what do we do with the ship? Like, are the Eldar going to come? And yeah. so I don't know if that is something that, you know, it's just an element that can be that we can look at? Um, like, do we trade the Mortis Probati into so, the Eldar? Let me ask you this then, we... to, to for, build on what Dave had said there. So the we've talked a lot about your characters and the start of the campaign and the mechanics of the game and whatnot. Let's talk about the story. 
Dave's talking about one of his favorite parts. So Dave, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just wanted to try to transition our conversation over to there. Yep. So you were saying, yeah, the, the Eldar, that was something, um, I could tell you that's something that I had uh, planned from the get-go, because again, I'm a sucker for the Eldar, but yep. you know, we sort of took our time building towards that. And I agree, like you guys really seem to be considering what the fuck to do with the ship afterwards. What other stuff? What are your, some of the uh, things that stand out for you over the past, the first 20, 20 sessions of our main campaign? Okay. If anything. <laughs> I mean, I, I liked the, um, I guess I liked the variety of, uh, we had a little space combat, then we're like sent down, then we all, got off the ship and explored the uh our target um a, a righteous path i think it was yep um and did a little and then went into exploration mode and then had some combat mode and i thought it went um you know we had we had we had quite a bit going on there like it was um there was mm -hmm. pretty good variety there and i think i i enjoyed that that there was um you know hit, hitting some different beats in yep. that in that sequence. Nice. Yeah. A little bit of big Xen of Xenos things, which is always pleasant. Mm -hmm. Well, particularly for uh, uh, Regius. A, a Xenophile like uh, Regius? Yeah. Like you, Dave, or you, your character? My character also has a, a love for Xenos lore, but I haven't played up on that much. Mm -hmm. um so i just kind of secretly yeah this is great <laughs> so one of the things i i talk about quite a bit in the traveler game is just it's um the fun the, one of the things i really love about running that game is just inhabiting the world is just spending time in there and seeing the characters do things and, and whatnot like it's just um the the world itself is realized enough and feels you know authentic enough um some of my favorite parts of this campaign have been when we've just been doing that stuff Whereas you guys yeah. interacting with the weird fucking stuff that's signature, you know, 40K, the, the weird cogitators and the, you know, uh, those battle servitors and the, oh, the threat of the Necrons and the fucking gene stealers in uh, oh, Wrath yeah. of Glory. Yeah. Yeah. It's also been neat uh, seeing you guys play the heads of Shep as well. Like we only really leaned more heavily into that in the second, in the, the last few months of our campaign, or that first uh, arc of it at least. But it's been neat seeing you guys actually interact with the ship and move around the ship. Yeah, yeah, like the um, the uh, unexpected combat against my steward was interesting. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. That was good. You know, I yeah. said, I'll give the game credit. I undervalued how good the combat is in this. I yeah. think it's it's a really like, uh, especially when the one when we played with the um, the battle mats and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I think it's it's like it is a much stronger combat system than what I gave it credit for when I read it. Yeah, it's it's fun. I think the FFG did a pretty good job. It's pretty good in Dark Heresy too. I mean, it's very similar, and um, we had a yeah. good time with it for for years. And, yeah. Uh, I have a I have a good feeling, you know. I have a good um, you know memories, and um, it's been good in Rogue Trader. That it's pretty fun, you know. I think the the strength uh, to the game too is that you guys have interesting decisions to make uh, for for every every round, right? Like that that's one of the things that I undervalued when I was looking at this is that the the amount of neat things you can do, whether it's to you know do your double tap or fire your thing at multiple rates or, you know, switch up weapons or whatever. Um, yeah. It's, it feels like there's a lot of stuff to, it's not an appendage to the, because in some of these D100 games, um, not, not any of the Warhammer games, but like uh, Combat and Call of Cthulhu, or to be honest, in, in uh, default Rune, like in RuneQuest Glorantha, to me feels boring as fuck. Like it just, mm -hmm. it's so simplistic that it doesn't feel particularly interesting. The spells and whatnot that you get to use in, in combat is what makes uh, RuneQuest, I think, a little more interesting. But this has a lot of cool tactical options and a lot of, like, setting aside your weaponry, 
different yep. decisions you can make in combat that feel kind of cool. Yep. Yep. Mm. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the uh, I think that's the case. Mm -hmm. When when Reggie <laughs> shot off an orc's leg through a piece of stone too, that was a, a pretty fun moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was kind of fun too. That, I can um, recommend that one, by the way, Jeff. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> that that weapon, yeah. that hell pistol, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll see how the profit factor acquisition acquisition <laughs> rolls go, Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Right. Yeah, you don't want to overcommit, Captain. <laughs> yes. So yes. What, don't get ahead of yourself. Is that something you guys are like? Like that's a we, we've for a campaign to have this kind of longevity with uh, everyone keep coming back to it at a point. Setting aside that you guys are great players and it's great seeing everyone. You know, uh, you all uh, role play well. You all, you know, you're great guys to play with. Um, what's the reason that brings you back to this particular game? And Jeff, you setting aside the concern that it's Friday fucking nights. <laughs> of course, you're gonna play. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Um, is there anything, or is it like like that's uh, for James in well, particular? I'm a, as James had said earlier, I'm a, I mean, I'm a fan of the setting. Uh, you know, getting to game in Warhammer Forty Thousand is fun, um, and uh, you know, in a lot of ways, we're just getting started too. I mean, we've been playing for a while, but but we got you know, I, I mean, I think we got a, a ways to go. I remember oh, yeah. you mentioning earlier, Kevin, about about this. Um, these adventures you have in mind and I'm, I'm interested in those and yeah. um and you know i got thoughts for quinelli as far as uh you know where he's gonna some advancement ideas you know where where he wants to go and um and i think <clears throat> i think i like the uh it, the built-in structure of a crew is kind of fun every game has to come up with its own reason for the people being together the PCs. Yeah. And so um, it's kind of fun, you know, Quinelli being management, you know, and the grousing and the, uh, you know, the faux ordering around, and, you know, whatever and all whatnot are, are pretty fun once in a while, you know, because it, it, it's kind of peculiar. Like, I mean, not, not many games. I mean, this happens once in a while, usually in a military setting. Maybe, you know, if the game is military or something, someone's got to be in charge, you know, that kind of a thing. Yeah. But it's a little unusual that you get this quite this dynamic and and um, it's it's different, you know? So it's kind of fun having a crew and, well, and being... I think it, to your credit too, Sean, like it's a tough role to play as a character who's, uh, as a player whose character is a superior to other characters. And by playing as, as him as kind of a, you know, pompous jokester kind of, you know, or like like almost like um, you know, amusing uh, pompous g uh, guy. It it takes some of the authority out. I guess that might provide friction with other players. Like I don't think any of the players here would have issues with that, right? But um, it's a tough thing to to incorporate into. Not every table can manage to have like okay, so and so is in charge, and you yes. you've made it a lot easier. <laughs> By, you know, making a character who's a little easier. He's not barking commands at everybody. He, you know, he is who he is, right? He's like, yeah, of course he's in charge, but like, and we follow him. <laughs> but he's not the one who's like, you go and do this and you go do that. Yeah. You know, like. It, you know, it, it, it's like go like as well. But that, yeah. I, I think wholly, I totally, yeah. totally agree. Because, you know, Kev, you know my star trek adventures horror story of the captain yeah it's a tricky thing to get right but it's really important because without a real a player character rogue trader or without a player character captain in star trek you're kind of missing a big thing you definitely you know, you're being told by the gm where to go what to do you lose a lot of agency oh definitely and you lose part of what's fun about that you know and i mean again yeah. like there's a credit also to all of you guys for playing with that nobody has like bristled against the the command structure or whatnot uh in it you've all picked characters who have fit within that and that's really important for a game like this to function properly right is if you're i gonna... mean if anything it's the opposite i would say in the mm. sense that not it's not like it's not me telling people what to do it's that like well so kevin's you know you'll be like okay so what do you guys do and 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 we're like you know kind of chattering and you're like 
so what do you guys do? And, so then James will, <laughs> and then so like James will go, Captain, what do we do? Like, you know, it'll come back at me, right? It's, you know, it's like, okay, you're in charge. What are we doing? You know, this kind of, yeah. Huh. Well, it's funny because yeah. we talked about that in our Wednesday game about assigning a leadership role to the to somebody in the group just because we sometimes just can't make up our damn minds. <laughs> like we don't know, don't know where we're going. There's too many pl plot yeah. threads, too many quests, too many things to do, and it's just like, well, maybe we just got to get somebody to, to be the leader to step up and say, okay, this is what we're doing. Yeah. We all tend to be very accommodating people. Yeah. And so with no one is declared to be in charge, then, you know, sometimes it's harder for us to make a decision, so to speak, because we're, you know, we all want to make sure that everyone's getting the experience out of the game that they want. Yeah. And, you know, one of the important ways to do that is, you know, to continue to be accommodating. So, yeah. Just call mm -hmm. it like it is, Jeff. We're all people pleasers. <laughs> kind <laughs> of, you know. We're... I'm just kidding. Kind of useful too that um, Cornelius. It's it's built into the story a little bit too that Cornelius young. It's his first, it's his first time out of the docks in yeah. this way. So you know he's not supposed to exactly know what he's doing. You know, I mean, kind of, sort of by by name, you know, but not by experience. So yeah, yeah. That's I think that um, that definitely helps as well. Um, the so we were talking, uh, Dave. You mentioned the character tree, the dark sun idea for that too. We've talked about well, like how to handle the rest of the crew on here, and um, we we haven't landed on anything. I so having played uh, Wrath and Glory, or run Wrath and Glory now for four sessions. So let's maybe transition talk about the the war story because fortunately we did get a chance to get everybody in on that at one point too. Unsuccessfully, I, I didn't kill anybody with a gene stealer. So, you know, that uh, to do item on my whiteboard remains unchecked. But uh, um, the game definitely was a, a challenge, not necessarily a challenge, but like because of the choice of nomenclature in that game, it, I, it did feel like there was a bit of a struggle to get everyone up and running on that. But I felt like, in particular, by the, the final session of it, you guys were all playing your characters as optimally as you could and were making smart, you know, tactical decisions for all of your characters with their capabilities. Did that, that was from the GM side of the screen. How did that feel on your side of the screen? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought so. And, and, um, and it's always good to get, you know, I, I like Warhammer and I like new, you know, I like, I like, um, I get, I like getting to try new games anyway, and it's in, it's in the Warhammer universe again, and so you know it had a lot going for it for me out of the blocks, and that you know I just get get to um, yeah let's do this this is good um, I, I want to give this a shot anyway, and so yeah I thought it went I thought it went fine I thought it was good I was uh, and I liked getting to play something totally different you know than mm -hmm. I was like so the medic was uh, running around and doing had a little combat and had a little healing and I thought it was good. Mm -hmm. James and Jeff, yeah. you were the guys who were stuck with it uh, the longest. You played at all the sessions. Wouldn't? What was your takeaway from Wrath and Glory? It's funny because my my takeaway was, even though we did kind of a lot of combat and uh, that, um, I was more engrossed in the story of what was going on and what was happening in that world that I was more focused on the story than the um than the like gameplay or the mechanics rules you know mm. like to me what was happening was important and so and especially the way it tied back to our other campaign that i don't know that I, I didn't get a as much of a feel for the rules maybe as i could have if i was less focused on the story i don't know hmm. they kind of they felt close to this not like adjacent to this at least enough that they they kind of flowed smoothly the the combat was maybe a little better a little more engaging in that a little more mm -hmm. but other than that yeah i, I don't know mm -hmm. 
the game system felt similar and I was just caught up in the story. Yeah, and in fairness, your character didn't have an awful lot of, um, it was the chatty chatty stuff that your character particularly excelled with. So you didn't necessarily have, you know, I, I'm trying to, to soft pedal that you didn't have a shuriken gun. So, I mean, you know. Right, exactly. I didn't <laughs> yeah. have a shuriken gun. Exactly. That is absolutely true. What about you, James? I might be able to find one for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's a funny one, right? The um, I think I really enjoyed it, uh, but somehow I'm still making heavy weather of understanding the rules. I've got the darn rule book as well, obviously, and but still, uh, it helps that it's all automated. Yeah. Um, Oh, yeah. But I don't know why I'm making such heavy weather of the rules because it's not that complicated. How many I think dice pool two, games? It's have... a terminology and the. Yeah, how many dice pool games do you have you played uh, before? Like uh, Warhammer oh. or Star Trek? Uh, no, no um, Warhammer. Have you like? I'm thinking of games like uh, The World of Darkness or Shadowrun no. or West End Star Wars. No, so maybe that's it partly, but. Um. Yeah, a funny one. Funny one, uh, and the ter uh, we talked about it before. The terminology doesn't help. The two meta currencies, which somehow I struggle to get in my head as to which does what. Um, yeah, I, I think it's you know keyboard to uh, it's chair to keyboard error rather than <laughs> a flaw in yeah, the uh, a flaw in the system. I think the game's good, and that's my hesitance to run with it. Otherwise, because I think. Uh, you know, p first sessions are not good, so using it at a face-to-face -face convention style thing mm -hmm. will be a toughie. Hmm. What were you, but Dave? If you, if you practice it, I think it could be very good. Yeah, so like I, well, I'll tell you my two cents on it afterwards, but Dave, what, did you, what about you? you? You only had the one session you're, that you're playing in it, and you're kind of thrown in the deep end with combat, but what, what, were your, what was your takeaway from it? Dude, I was a badass elbow with a shuriken gun. What more could you say? <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. It was awesome in all kinds of ways. And I missed the earlier part of the adventures, the context as to what we were doing other than stopping the gene stealers. Mm. A little vague, but that's all right. Um, run in, hip deep in corpses and add more to the floor. That's That was fine. Mm. Combat was, was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. And I liked the... Um, I don't know, not the witch, the block, the witch, but like that, uh, James's character and the other psionicist or whatever were had this like battle going on that no one could see, but it was still affecting people. And it was just like, fuck, yeah. like, <laughs> cause in, in other games, you typically see the magical elements or the, or the sorcerer's elements. They, they have visual components that like, a spell is cast you see what happens okay the, maybe it's something invisible like the person just stops moving or or something like that but you know that a, a spell was cast but here it's just like dudes are fighting in their heads and they're in my head and yeah mm -hmm. that was kind of cool too lots of cool factor yeah well that's great it's, uh, that's great to hear too the um yeah the the game has a lot of um, it has a lot of, I think, uh, moving parts in it, uh, as far as like, uh, ad adversaries and the different, uh, like there's the shock and there's the, um, the wound damage. Um, but the, I think it's the, one of the most exciting combats I've run. I think it was, it was probably the most exciting combat I've run with a Warhammer game full stop. Um, and I really enjoy the combat in uh, Soulbound quite a bit as well. But that last session we played with all four of you guys uh, going in with a variety of different, uh, like the, um, the guns that could fire more than one shot and the different variety of enemies. The minion rules are fucking great in that game. Um, and the, it, and the grenades? Grenades are so well balanced in it. Like a real threat, definitely, but not something that... Um, yeah, and I think that the the way the game felt, it felt like you guys were um, 
off balance almost the entire fight where so there wasn't a feeling of desperation and the feeling of a part of like having to or getting to decide you know what order you guys act in and then whether you're using it sitting here tonight is, is maybe difficult to remember but you guys were making really good decisions about your narrative narrative meta currency uh as things were coming up and every time someone got that role to feed back in when they rolled a I can't remember what it's called, uh, Exalted um, Icon, and on your Wrath Dice, and you were feeding one back in, like the whole table cheered. And that's something that's, having something else that feeds into the excitement at the table, it's it's what drawing a, um, what do you call it? A Joker in uh, Savage Worlds in Initiative is like, right? It's just there when those, those beats where everybody gets a, a payoff from it, it's really cool. And I feel like it does it in a way that is more substantive and interesting than I found with the Fantasy Flight games or with the 2D20 uh, Modifius games, which this game is obviously taking a lot of design cues from with its different levels of adversaries and stuff. Um, yeah, like it was uh, one of the most satisfying combat things I've run in 40K and uh, it felt uh, it felt like you guys were able to jump into the game and start playing pretty quickly too well once you got the handle on the rules and whatnot um the downside is for in my mind from that game the runway for characters like one of the things you guys talked about liking in this uh game is you guys are getting xp and be able to change your characters fairly you know regularly and you can do that in that game but the gap between uh, tiers of play is a lot more narrow in that game rules like rules is written and just assuming you're awarding xp the way that they say to award xp which i think is like 10 per session and i think it's 100 per tier which means you guys would have gone up two tiers over the course of this campaign and tiers of play for those listening at home who may not be familiar with it tiers of play are like power levels of play so it's not a matter of just like, oh, I've gone up a level and we're within the same power band. Like in that game, tier one are like Hiver gangers and tier three are tax space marines. So mm. if you're going up in tiers, that's the same problem you have with kind of like exponential growth with a level-based game like D&D, where mm. the, the characters you're playing at 15th level are gonna be wholly unrecognizable from who they were at first level. Yeah. Right. So, how do you integrate that into a system or a game like this? Like, how do you bring characters like those into this game without having to totally restructure them? Yeah. Based on the experience that you give out in this game. Well, and that's like, well, this wouldn't be the first time we switched, you know, between systems with characters or whatnot. But the reason I mentioned those uh, is because while I think that um, that that is an issue, or it might be a bugger bear, I haven't run it as an ongoing game, so I might be totally wrong about that. Um, and there, the the change over levels may not be as dramatic as I think it is. But what I'm thinking is that the because it is a easier game to jump into and have competent characters at those levels, that's probably an, a more optimal game to run than a leveled up characters in this game for the purpose of war stories or for the purpose of checking in on other crew members. Yep. Yep, yep. That, I see thumbs up from one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for all you guys. Um, any other thoughts on, on uh, Wrath and Glory or the, the time we spent in that? The the characters, as far as you, you asked earlier, Dave, whether that's uh, part of this campaign, and yeah, like everything that happened in that campaign will have happened or in that war story is applicable in this campaign. Um, that would have taken place probably uh, about six months or so before the events of... The, oh, even more more than that. Uh, so there might be ripe opportunity for you know filling in those um, uh, those ad like additional uh, months uh, with future war stories. But um, and as far as the Eldar is is concerned too, like that's something to, to we'll discover I guess over the course of play. And I'd be I'd welcome your input, Dave, in particular for uh, what your sort of uh, your character's goal would be with that. 
But that leads to the question of other war stories. Like the the campaign does set up the idea of um, the, the 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 way that having a, cr- a ship full of other crew members. Uh, the potential for having other crew members tagging along or going along on missions or whatnot in the Star Trek Adventures kind of style is definitely there. But I don't think that's an assumed part of play or an assumed style of play at all in the game. I think that what the game assumes is that you're playing these characters and everyone else would be an NPC. Right. So, um, and again, like who gives a shit what what the assumed style of play is? It comes down to what you guys would be interested in doing. Um... What would you want to be doing with the the pot? Like, I guess with that part of the of the game, do you want other characters that you'd be playing to be brought into the future parts of the stories, or do we keep their stories discreet in kind of a uh, separate, you know, and now turning over to the lower decks, you know, kind of thing? Or like one of the things that you guys have all done with all your characters is you've really established clear personalities and interactions and whatnot with the characters to the point I think we can judge without players being here what characters might do. Um, right. But, I mean, you guys would do that with any... You guys are just great role players so that you'll do that with any character. But uh, these are the stars of the campaign as well. The function in Star Trek Adventures is a lot lighter touch uh, than it is in this one um, in the sense that the, the, the NPCs are mechanically more simplistic than they are for these but um, what do you uh, guys think? It reminds me of a comment I was going to make uh, a bit ago and I forgot <laughs> but uh, on NPCs I mean I, I think I have an envision more of separate that they're uh, that it was kind of fun to play on its own. And I can be easily talked out of that. I don't know. That's just, a, that's a surface thought of, you know, that's what I think I think. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good, that's my, favorite, that's my favorite phrase in these moments. I think, I think that. Uh, you guys are far so, too uh, accommodating <laughs> as players. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, uh, and this, this, this is a thought from before, but it's on NPCs, that it was a little bit fun. I thought it was kind of fun when we were in charge lightly in charge of um of some npcs like we you know we had our away party yeah and so we had so many of our crew members and then we split up the crew members per pc and so you'd go okay dave what are your pc what do your npcs do and then we each we had to make an extra decision on that a little bit of decision you know yeah so i thought that was that was kind of fun that was kind of fun in a command role that we got a little bit of something a little something something with the uh ordering around some peons to do some stuff. Yeah. Well, I think that also it added another way of me establishing stakes without having to fucking kill you guys, right? Right. Yeah. That, yeah. Like, I, I didn't intentionally kill characters and whatnot, but like when I knew that there were a whole bunch of uh, NPCs that you guys could, I could chew up, I wasn't super concerned about just accidentally heavy boltering you guys. Yeah, yeah. What do the rest of you guys think about that? About what uh, Sean said? Yeah, I agree. I, I liked it. I I think it was good having those, um, I don't know, expendables around a little bit. Um, I could see that being valuable going forward as, you know, having more of those, uh, in exploring the NPCs more, so to speak. Like I, I think that they're we making all those characters created a really interesting crew, I think, to go back to and incorporate and use as cannon fodder. And <laughs> mm-hmm. um, not that I not that I think they're expendable um, and, you know, wouldn't try to protect them. But um See, that's Alessandra sounding like management. That's what I say. That's see, there you go. <laughs> but in forty K there is only war. So. <laughs> yeah. James, Dave, any thoughts on that or the uh, uh yeah, I, other members of the crew in general? I think I, I definitely 
you know, if we can keep the other members of the crew at the NPCs, that that's fine as well. Um, I do like the the what James and Jeff are talking about bringing the little cl clumps of troops. I think that's more impactful than saying your troop numbers dropped from twenty nine thousand five hundred to twenty nine thousand. Like, well, who cares? Like, five hundred people died. Ooh, terrible. But like, when you see little figurines there, it's like. Maybe we can even give them names, like this is Ben and this is Jared, and Jared's got two kids, and you know, but yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we could just. I, I like that. That was a good, a good fun combat too. Mm. James is up. Yeah, James. What about you? Um. No, I'm just. Uh, I've I've enjoyed it so far, and I I enjoy the fact that Rogue Trader can go many directions. So, if uh, as we see the flow, I think it uh, very happy with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But I think it makes a whole big difference with who you're playing with, because I've had, um, you know, we talked about the whole captain role thing. Yeah. But also the whole who you're playing with and who you're GMing could really affect on uh, Warhammer 40k because to your the way you put it earlier was um, it can all go very 90s mm. if you don't watch out and can go very murder hobo very quickly <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah. uh, then it derails badly I think mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a game I found a little bit tricky um, playing it with um, people you don't know uh, can go very badly wrong. Yeah. Now, does Regius let on that Quinelli is a better captain than what Regius has had before? <laughs> He's God. not that much of a kisser, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was glad Quinelli to hear Jeff that... Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Dave, sorry. I would say Quinelli's grasping at straws. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear Jeff that you enjoyed the story part of that other one because that really was like ideally this that's the purpose of these war stories is to really introduce elements to feed back into the main story right not just to give little vignettes out at the side and that was the intent with that one was um, not only it was a happy excuse to try out Rogue uh, or um, Wrath and Glory but it was also intended to sort of give an idea of what to expect when you get back to Footfall right you know yeah and yeah. giving you guys a way of doing that i might take that lesson in future uh as well we um so we've got the other 40k game that we have not uh, talked about uh at least one like one that would directly relate into this uh the aquare household might be um imperium maledictum um, and my two cents on that uh, are, and I'm welcome to hear from you guys if you would rather, like, if you, there is, you're dying to get that one to the table. The th my thoughts are is that one, it's very similar, I, it's, mechanically, it seems, to what Rogue Trader is. So it would be, you know, uh, a, it would be a gradations of change from what we're seeing right now, and it wouldn't really be the fundamental change that uh, we saw with Wrath and Glory. Uh, which it is good. Uh, uh, there's advantages to that. The second thing is, is the game line is too new right now. I think there's only the, there's the core rulebook and there's a GM line out for it. So um, my thought right now is uh, I'm not intending on running any Imperium Maledictum until we see some more books come out for the game line, just because I want to have more stuff to draw from. Uh, there's, I mean, yeah. I'm not even sure I've got stats for orcs in the in the base book. Like there's. Uh, very limited range of things you can use right now. I could create my own shit, but you know, when I've got a book full of Xenos in um, uh, Xenos threats for this game and for um, Wrath and Glory, I, I feel like by comparison, that one is probably just the better choice. But if, you, if any of you guys feel like you know you're dying to, to see uh, Imperium Maledictum, that's something I can consider using because the low level. Uh, power level in that game definitely would suit like a lower decks kind of thing and for those i mean I, lower decks the next generation episode not the tv series yeah i mean I, I would say i mean i'm i am dying to play it at the same time <laughs> i wouldn't i wouldn't anticipate um like switching it'd be more of a thing of like you know maybe the next wrath and glory is imperium maledictum you know maybe we play a one shot 
Sean wants sorry. to play Wrath and Glory so badly again, he cannot help but call every war story exactly. a Wrath and Glory. Yep. Um, yeah. So you know when they're when it's appropriate, you know, a one shot of or whatever of Imperial Maledictum okay. is, would be sounds fun. You know, definitely on my it's on my radar for sure. But yeah, and but to your point, you know, uh, yeah, I'm happy to wait while some more stuff comes out because, like you said, you've I've I had a flick through my happy um, Christmas present, but mm -hmm. I'm sort of waiting for the more to arrive to uh, really dive in because it's um, it's a bit partial at the moment. It's looking really good. Yeah, but, like, uh, I think in a year's time it'll be great. But uh, yeah, like once there's six books out for it, I think it like it will have a much better idea of and. I, I th I'm confident enough to say the strength of Cubicle Seven's releases to date, it's going to be an amazing game. It just it needs time for more stuff to come out for it. Yeah, I was, you know, I was it, running uh, Dark Heresy, and I was thought, but well, maybe Imperium Mal there. But there's so much for Dark Heresy too that, it, well, and more you to know, the point, even if you say, well, the systems may be better, and yeah, but there's but so the, much. The <laughs> thing is, there's so much missing from it right now too. Yeah, and that's the problem I find is just that there's. Um, I'd be making up so much stuff for it all to to be able to suit even some of the stuff that we'd be running in this. Like, why not just use Road Trader then, or use something? Right, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah. I think switching makes no. I think it's. But that's good to know, yeah. John. You know, Sean. I'll keep in mind though. Like, if there is an idea I have or something that comes up in in the course of the adventure, I'm like, ah, maybe this would be a fun way. I'll I'll, I'll back burner that and reacquaint myself with. Um, um, Wrath and Glory, Wrath and Glory. I'm doing it now with uh, Imperium Maledictum. Yeah, yeah. And, and and for the, I mean, I I have definitely gone through. There's there's a ton of stuff for Dark Heresy. So for a little bit of at least inspiration, Dark Heresy material could be useful for. Oh yeah, uh, and I think if if I've got an opportunity to tie in a, um, I will tell you this is that it, um, if I do have an opportunity to tie in any kind of Space Marine thing to this particular campaign i will use death watch for it because yeah, i think there there's there's yeah. a lot of love for death watch around this table and um i i think that the game that that game is is a really really well designed game like with, with us it requires i think some player expertise but that handouts will, will handle that shit plus it's playing space marines um <laughs> <laughs> let's see here the uh, yeah, so I've got Long Road with, with Wrath and Glory was with Yeah, that's that's the only only issue I have with that particular game. I fucking love that game. I, I had so much fun running it. It was so much fun prepping it. The combat was exciting as hell. And I think they um Yeah, I don't know. Uh you know what's so interesting I, I found about it? The fact that it doesn't have zones, I like so much. Because so many of those games, when they have the like um, the different kinds of adversaries or whatnot, they also want to abstract the play space, and mm -hmm. that's not a bad thing. But it's really hard using a battle mat sometimes when to try and judge like what's zones, because yeah. Conan does that and whatnot. It's not bad. It's those are really really helpful if you're not using a battle mat. But yeah. um, and you can play with a battle mat using zones because we did we had a really fun uh, soulbound uh, adventure that we played with those, but. Um, I really love the the mix of having that tat like uh, you had a square per square movement rate. You were measuring ranges and whatnot. Um, yep. But we also had that fucking mini mechanic that was badass. Anyway, I mean, yeah. I'd def definitely be happy to play uh, Wrath and Glory again. Oh yeah, so. I think that that's a foregone conclusion. So I, I, I appreciate that you're willing to go along with it. I, I think that uh, I don't know what. Um, I think that our going back to the I guess, as an aside, um, giving XP in that game also is because you get while there is the concern of the long road, you can buy stuff pretty regularly in that too. Now, we didn't really make use of that, but. That's something where I would want you guys to, if we're going to revisit the same characters, you guys choose how you those characters change. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's more a certain ownership over that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Any other thoughts on the uh, campaign? Or uh, first off, do you have any questions for each other? You guys need me to do something during ship combat? 
<laughs> I think I actually have picked up the ballistic skills for, for specifically for that so I could get on a gun or something. But... Nice. I'm not sure it's ballistic skill that's used mm. in it, though. It is. Maybe that was it just is. for... Oh, no, is it? Shoot. Yeah, that's why I upped my ballistic skill, <laughs> particularly bonkers. to be a less crap in, uh, <laughs> in <laughs> space combat. Oh, jeez. A pistol, two kilometer long uh, rail gun. They're the same. <laughs> same principles, yeah. <laughs> point, and, point and shoot. Yeah. yeah. I must say, one of the things I love about um, uh, one of the scenes reading in a book of uh, Warhammer was talking about how on one of the big Imperial ships that, you know, they had the cannon, right? So you've got this huge cannon that's however you know kilometer long and everything and of course how do they load it it's chain gangs of men dragging the shells into the gun and <laughs> <Yeah>. all the rest <laughs> of it <laughs> right. and then the sound of it deafens everyone when it goes off <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so. classic so if you don't have questions for each other do you have any questions for me um How have you been enjoying this game, Kevin? What what would you say are the most positive, you know, parts of this current adventure and campaign or game? Mm. What, uh, what is I it that love, you enjoy? Yeah, like I spend a lot of time, I, and I really don't want to. It's because when I stumble, when I when I have things that I'm trying to fix, I am a problem solver at heart, and it drives me nuts when I can't, you know, cut that knot. So. I, the reason I've yapped about the um, profit factor and the things is that I feel like I'm l not letting down the campaign, but by not finding what is good about that, it's driving me crazy. So that part of it mm. drives me nuts about the game in general. The play itself, the characters you guys have made, the moment-to-moment -moment stuff, the getting to spend time in this world with you guys playing these characters, all that stuff is amazing. I love these characters. Um, there, you can tell that something is hitting right with the uh, chemistry that comes from playing a group when you have those running jokes that pay, play over into the other games. Right? We all know who the Aquares are right now. You know, um, we know who's chowing on cactuses every time we jump into the fucking warp. Right? Like, right. There's, that's the stuff that I I love, and I'm loving. There are so many elements about the Rogue Trader setting. And I mean, like my first exposure to Rogue Trader was, and I, I, I don't, um, nothing nauseates me more than people trying to appeal to like, well, I got into it in this point. And so I don't mean it as this, but my first exposure to Rogue Tra to Warhammer 40K was the original Rogue Trader game. And then I dropped out for quite a while. Uh, and then I only came back in later. But that Rogue Trader book, I read so much, all of the pages fell out. I adored that setting i love the book the art was amazing and then the what i've learned about the uh, what's happened in the interim between when i played it and when i did got back to the game is all stuff that's amazing it's such an incredible setting that has built up over that time and getting to go out and include some of that stuff um i absolutely love you know it's so much fun i think the even more so than uh, like when we get to play Star Wars games, it's a lot of fun, you know, because oh, there's stormtroopers and oh, there's whatever else. This hits more for me than that. When I got to incorporate Necron into it and try and kill you guys with that, fucking awesome. When we got to have a Eldar player character in it, amazing. Uh, when we get to do this kind of like you guys exploring a ship, you're in charge of it and there's stuff going on and we're playing at that kind of scale, fantastic stuff and the fact that you guys are engaging with all the material with such gusto and feeding back into the setting um that's all the stuff that i thoroughly enjoy about this campaign you know and nice. the the regular frustration i have with it is only because of the 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 parts of the rules that i've um i have not found a way to solve that problem yet um, the you know what the the other issue I was and it's not an issue but like the the 
um, and this is just a nature of scheduling, you know, and it, it speaks to everyone's involvement. And I'm so glad to hear that you guys have been enjoying seeing your characters advance. The regular play is tricky, right? Like, because we, I'm happy to run other stuff when we have those things, you know? Um, Elder Scrolls is constantly lurking at the sidelines there, so it's always happy to take a time at bat. But um, that's been the, you know, when we're playing once a month, any game we play once a month, when we play other games more frequently, is tough to maintain that level of like, okay, I'm gonna get my shit ready, I'm gonna get shit prepped, because I know it's gonna come to the table this time. You know, yeah. um, and mm -hmm. that's just the way it is. That is that is a, our Friday night games are always, um, you know, soft commitments for the dates because it's just Fridays are tougher to have a regular thing. Wednesdays, it's rare that shit comes up for people to have to go and do something else. Fridays, that's just a reality of often stuff comes up. So the thing I, uh, I love about this is that we've still... I love that you guys are still that enthusiastic about the next leg of the campaign, even though we've only been able to play one, you know, on average once a, a month. That makes me really fucking happy because player, I can, um, part of, of uh, having a successful long-term campaign, I think, is the GM commitment to that date to make sure you're there, to make sure you're ready to run, to make sure it's ready to go. But the player enthusiasm, knowing their characters, knowing what they want to do with their characters, jumping into whatever the scenario is, you guys never balk from that. I don't think I've ever heard, particularly in this campaign, any of you guys say, I don't remember what the fuck was going on. You guys always remember. And that says something, you know, for when we're only playing once a month. So that's something I also really enjoy about this particular campaign. Um, the I think, yeah, but as you say, the uh, the system's not perfect, not by a long shot. But at the end of the day, it's still a great game anyway. 100%. And it's, I love the setting. I think it's fantastic. And I think finding a group of players like this to play with for this setting is really hard. It is, especially for an ongoing uh, thing, too. And that's where I'm like... Um, I am reluctant to run war stories more often because we play so infrequently with it. When we run a war story, it really does derail something, which was nice about being able to play that full one through to conclusion because we got to get the whole crew back together for that final session. And that was fucking mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, and the, the fact that we're learning the game over the course of, of play, because like, you can read a game and you can master the rules or whatnot, but you don't know what the actual play experience is like and the balancing of how like combat plays out and how many hit points some of the needs and how all the different parts of like armor piercing and whatever all come together. I feel like we're really learning that, you know, uh, over the course. So I have felt more comf uh, more comfortable introducing combat in, in more interesting ways, which is a... It, and probably should be a part of a, any 40k setting because it is a grim and perilous, you know, uh, future. Um, yeah. So that's stuff I, I, I like, uh, Jeff. Th those are all the positives uh, that I think. It, it's a great, uh, like really, it's a setting I, I really, really love. Um, we all, I think, have a similar understanding of what that setting's sensibility should be. You know, which is to say fucking shuriken guns all the goddamn time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they don't hurt, that's for sure. No, I but mean, it's to have around, not yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. Like I it's um yeah, it's great. It, it's a I, I really want to solve that um that issue I have with the profit factor thing but this is where it's really helpful to have these kind of you know retrospective see what things are like on your side of the screen because if you guys have not been constantly going back to those rules and figuring trying to you know, make heads or tails out of them um then it is a problem that i that so if it's not a problem for you guys it should not be a problem for me either right so that is an easy uh an easy resolution to that yep Mm. Yep. I have a question for you, Kev. Are, yeah, yeah. There, tyranids, are there Tyranids in the Expanse? Just curious. Uh, in the Chronos Expanse, there's not, which is one of the big fucking problems of having the Gene Stealers trying to make their way in. Huh. Because the Gene Stealer cult, what they serve as is a beacon to draw the Tyranids in. 
So if they had gone in there in a place, they are a deeply psychic race um, in a different way from the way that the Eldar are, but that particular location also had a bunch of devices that were being made with the tiny little um, essence or tiny little fragments or whatnot of the emperor himself, an infinitesimally small bit of one of the most powerful psychic beings in the entire universe. If they had gained access to that, um, if I were to use a sci-fi bad, you know, analogy kind of thing, it would almost be like a signal booster for them. So that could very quickly become a problem for this entire region. Um, you guys thankfully dealt with that. Okay. That's what we do. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> exactly. So no Tyranids for now. No Tyranids for now, but there are plenty of other terrible things in, in the region here. Um, yeah, I was just going through a checklist of, of nasty things that you could throw at us. And I was like, all right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Tyranids are really up there, though, aren't they? They're pretty <laughs> fucking <They're> falling. <laughs> they... Dark Eldar, Tyranids. Yeah, they're, they're, they're near the top. <laughs> well, I mean, like, the Dark Eldar and the Eldar themselves are, like, they can be individually quite terrifying and whatnot. Um, the, you know, civilization-ending scale that comes with the Tyranids uh, is just unlike any other kind of threat in there. Or Orcs are terrible, too, because they're persisting and whatnot, too. But it is a, like, um, perpetuating inf infestation that... It, you know, causes violence in a way that is recognizable to other species. The Tyranid consumes everything. It's truly one of the most terrifying uh, things in the 40k universe. The prospect that, like, if you don't stop these gene stealers uh, from building up their cult in time, this whole planet and everything on it is going to be transformed into more Tyranids. It's a wonderful threat to have as a GM. Uh, and it's great that that first adventure uh, for Death Watch uh, takes place on a planet mid infestation. You have to go in, do your fucking job and get off. That planet is dead. It's a foregone conclusion. It's just a question of whether your gene seed and your material gets churned up into the swarm and made into more things. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, anyone else have any other questions? Not that you have to, by any means. Uh, don't think so. One thing I will say about 40K that is really great is we've got such an abundance of awesome RPGs to try running this with that I don't even need to dip into any fan-made stuff whatsoever, you know? You know that there's yeah. like Savage World stuff out there and there's like FFG Genesis, you know, adaptations for stuff out there too. I don't even have to think about any of that stuff with how many fucking awesome RPGs there are with so much content. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, Savage World yeah. is fun. Hmm. Savage Worlds is awesome, but I think that uh, Wrath and Glory achieves many of the same kind of beats that Savage Worlds does as far as like <laughs> exciting combat and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so it, um, we haven't played uh, Space Marines, but uh, the way the mini mechanics work, it's a challenging game to get your, your head around. I think more so than Warhammer Fantasy 4 took me a while to get my head around how the, all the mechanics kind of work in that and to appreciate how complex and, and how there can be moving parts in combat. Um, I think Wrath and Glory is even a little more so. Uh, I welcome those kinds of challenges, mind, but um, there's a lot to sort of get a handle on with the game. Uh, but that last fight, oh man, oh man. <laughs> That was a lot of fucking fun. When you guys were chewing down like six and seven, uh, you know, gene sealers in one blast, that's that's pretty badass. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. we need Typical to invest in this. And, and, and Wrath and Glory's got much better since you found the um, chapter rules. Oh my God. Yeah, I can't believe I missed that. <laughs> Again, so like for a long time we were saying that like oh it'd be even better if there was actual chapter <laughs> rules for the Space Marines. It's in the fucking like a page away from the start of the thing in Space Marines. Yeah, that was bonkers. 
Um, the uh, any last uh, comments or questions or anything for one another about our uh, Road Trader campaign? That is 19 months, guys, where we have been playing this game so far. Well, uh, where it may spin off to is, uh, as you know, I had all my PC problems, but one of my players kindly helped me um, rebuild it. And uh, she's wanting to play Rogue Trader. She'd had a bad experience playing Rogue mm. Trader before, but now is canvassing for a Rogue Trader game. So uh, it may have a spin-off uh, elsewhere on the oh, planet. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> you know what, nice. James? I wonder how much of the issue was, because you were ch struggling with Wrath and Glory the whole time you were having those PC issues too. Yeah, that probably didn't help. Hmm. Huh. Hmm. That's because yeah, maybe Wrath, maybe Wrath and Glory broke my PC. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was it your was move. I think something got knocked loose in the, in the move. But yeah, yeah, that's that's possible too. I, I guess. Um, the will of the Emperor. No, I hadn't even thought about that, but the thing, but yeah, like because you weren't, you were having such a fuck of a time trying to interact with the PC and your token and all the other stuff too. Like that's just adding a whole other level of frustration to interfacing with the game. So. You know, yeah, yeah. It yeah, yeah. so I, I guess I have to make sure you now with your shiny new PC that you get a really good experience with uh, with Wrath and Glory <laughs> next time. That's oh, yeah, no. well, it was still good despite all the problems I was having, so that shows you that the game was good. Oh, absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, I don't know, Jeff, anything else you got to say? Uh, I don't know if I have anything else to add. What would you guys play? If we had a brand new crew of rogue traders using the rogue trader RPG, what would you play if you had it to do all over again? Can I say a space marine? <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> <laughs> We'd play the Death Watch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that is such a tough choice. I guess. Just... Oh, good. Um. I was going to say, like, I, I think that I agree with maybe what Sean said before. The psychers seem very interesting and uh, uh, well done in this game. So that would be an interesting choice for me, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Did I steal yeah, your so answer, Sean? Well, I mean, I'd already, you know, I was I was already out there for psychers. So, yeah, psyker or... Um... <laughs> I'm trying to think what else is a little bit out of the, uh, maybe a Mechanicus. Yeah, the Explorator. Yeah, like uh, you get some interesting, um, it's different. You know, you, you get your, you get your Mechanicus on and, uh, and it's its whole way of, his whole way of thinking um, and his, uh, ex uh, I can't think of the word, but you know, the extremities. The, the Mechadendrites, um, I think they're called. Mechadendrites, yeah, be pretty cool. Um, so I would say I would go, I'll, I'll put those two out there. Mm -hmm. Dave, James. Oh, so, well, I'm I'm with uh, Jeff. Uh, uh, Psychos is a good one. If I was otherwise, I think also Mechanicus very good. Um, otherwise, I would revert to Adeptus Arbiters for a mm -hmm. the, the less thinking approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that'd be an interesting one too. I forgot about that, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm second guessing myself on that mechadendrite thing. It is. I think you're right. It is. Holy right. shit. Yeah, See, yeah. as I mean, it's fucking like resin up here. Yeah. <laughs> it's just. <Yeah. laughs> what about you, Dave? Hmm. You know, I was looking at the art militant back when we first started playing this game, but. I always, you know, like the whole, um, with, was it the missionary we talked about and that, that would, we would call in to help rid the ship of Xenos and influences of or hunt uh, down Inquisitor? The... A missionary okay. would certainly have a role to play in that, but there's also sort of a morale component to that. Mm. But the Inquisitor is the separate one. They're the ones who uh, hunt the foes of the Emperor. Whether from within, without, or beyond. 
Yeah, I, I, Inquisitor would be pretty awesome. That would be, yeah. Hmm. I think I would try to stay away from the martial character and try to do something a little more different mm -hmm. that I haven't played in the past. Uh, are the psychers illegal or no, they can be? There's, I mean, they can be, yeah, they're, they're rogue psychers, but uh, the, the ones that are part of the... Sanctioned. Sa yeah, there's so there's sanctioned psychers, and then there's astropaths who have a specific training uh, for communicating effectively over, like, the two guinds of psychers you see in the Rogue Trader game are astropaths, who are specifically trained to sort of communicate over long distances, in particular, and the um, navigators, who are, you know, going through space. Sanctioned psychers are sort of... Uh... Is that what they call them in um, Dark Heresy? Is Sanction Psychers, or is that just a yeah. carrier? Is it okay? So same name as in uh, Wrath and Glory. The Road Trader ones just—it's assumed that the Astropath is part of a like they have. That's what their primary thing is communicating over long distance because that's how you how long distance communication works in the 40k universe. Um, but they also give them some psychic powers as well. Uh, so you can specialize in different things like tel uh, telepathy or telekinesis or pyrokinesis or things like biokinesis. I think mm, in one of the 40k games, you could do that shit uh, too. But um, yeah, cool. All right. Well, 19 months down, more to come. So then any closing thoughts guys before we wrap up our uh, overview of the first nearly two years of this campaign Aquatic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i feel like okay. alessander might uh purge cactuses from the ship <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then, for those listening at home, thank you so much for joining us for our uh, retrospective on the first uh, eight or 19 months in uh, this campaign. Uh, as is always the case, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns regarding the session, the campaign, or the game we're playing, please don't hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section down below, and I'll endeavor to reply in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. um, there is also a, a link down below to uh, the Dungeon Musings Discord server, where we have a channel dedicated to Warhammer games in general. And uh, not only do we discuss uh, that over over there, we, uh, we discussed pretty much all the Warhammer games that were running on the channel, uh, including Soulbound and Wrath and Glory and this game and Warhammer Fantasy Fourth, and because it seems to be likely based on the C7 system as well, when the old world comes out, we'll probably start running that as well, and we'll probably uh, start running uh, Imperium Maledictum once we have a little more stuff on there. So questions or comments about any of those games, please head on over to there. And uh, we also have channels dedicated to most of the other games and campaigns we have on the channel, as well as um, find a group and uh, general discussion and whatnot. So there's uh, lots of great channels, a terrific community that's built up over the years over there. You are more than welcome to join us over there. Uh, there's also a link down below to our friends at Noble Knight Games. Now, the, the discount code has uh, changed, and I need to get the updated one for that, but um, the, uh, Knight, Knight, uh, Noble Knight is the preeminent uh, unionized retailer of hard to find and auto print RPGs in North America. Not only do they have a great selection of new role playing games, board games, and card games, they have an unmatched selection of hard to find and auto print RPGs. And if they don't have something in stock that you're looking for, you can put it on a want list and they'll send you an email when it comes in. Uh, there is also a link down below to something called Heroes Save Villages. That is the charity fundraising campaign we run on the channel. It benefits the SOS Children's Villages International Charity, a really incredible organization active in over 130 countries, benefiting over 80,000 orphaned and abandoned children. Um, you, Any donations that go through that link go directly to uh, SOS Children's Villages International. None of it goes to the channel or any other middleman, just goes to help out the kids who benefit from their services. And as a small way of saying thank you, we are currently voting uh, donors who have donated $25 <laughs> or more uh, since January 1st, 2024, are heading over to the Charity Initiatives channel on the Dungeon Musings Discord server and voting for our Star Wars sessions. Uh, we have determined that one of the sessions will be set during the Heir to the Empire era, so the Thrawn Trilogy era, and one will be set during the Rebellion we are currently voting on what kind of heroes we will play. And then next week, we're gonna be voting on the villains they'll face. And then the week after that, 
We're voting on what Star Wars RPG we'll be using, and we'll have official and non-official options there. Wrath and Glory as Star Wars, eh? Hmm. <laughs> Everything looks like a nail. I <laughs> swear you with that, with that hammer. Um, who am I kidding? It's going to be the fucking Elder Scrolls Star Wars game. Come on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's keep with our monthly theme. Um, there's a, so you can uh, if you donated twenty five dollars or more, head on over to the uh, Charity Initiatives channel, cast your vote on what kind of heroes you'd like us to play in that session, and then uh, next week after, come back and uh, vote on the villains. Uh, anyone who donates twenty five dollars or more since January first, twenty twenty four, will also be able to vote on the uh, charity sessions we'll be running in the second half of the year. And I have a fun idea in mind for that, so uh, we'll have some fun opportunities for the voters to make or the donors to vote on some fun options for those charity sessions the last thing i will say is a huge thank you to our explorers in this campaign i was genuinely surprised it was as long as this campaign has gone on um it just feels like a regular part of the schedule i didn't realize it had been almost two years for this one so sean james jeffrey and dave thank you so much for spending all this time in the coronas expanse with me i've had a great time it was really i really appreciate and a lot of times or uh, retrospectives we uh well we do is a shower praise on on what's going on and i really appreciate us you guys helping me tr tr struggle or, or wrestle with some of the issues that i've seen with the game i really do appreciate you guys uh helping um talk some of that stuff through i think it's going to make for a stronger campaign in the uh, in the long run and for those listening at home this is a great uh thing i don't think you need to do feedback you know after every session you're going to end up having analysis paralysis with everyone's feedback on stuff but this kind of thing can be really helpful in a long-term campaign to get a sense of where everyone's feet are at where their eyes are focused on and what the experience has been that you've missed out on as on the GM side of the screen. So I really appreciate you guys uh, agreeing to do this tonight. Um, but that's the last safe time you'll have. You'll be arriving back on Footfall in uh, two weeks' time. And then, oh boy, I am so sorry for what <laughs> awaits you there. Uh, but we'll be back on Footfall in two weeks' time. But until then, uh, oh, and of course, uh, 150 XP we get per session, I think. Is that right? That's um, 500. Okay. Is it 500? <laughs> fuck, I never get it right. These these Warhammer weekends, I always fuck it up. I give too little on Warhammer or too much on Warhammer. Oh, yeah. It's 100 on Warhammer and it's uh, fantasy. Yeah. And it's 500 here. Yeah, 500, 500 here. So you guys can take 500 XP um, and see what you choose to buy with that. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks' time. But until then, we hope that we gave you a few hours to take your mind off the troubles of our world and think about not the troubles, but some of the experiences we've had. Great experiences as well, too. I nearly killed some player characters with a Necron. I mean, undead robot uh, killing machine. <sighs> Those are good times. Uh, but until then, for those listening at home, stay safe. Stay healthy and happy gaming. <laughs>